shortly. Um, mm -hmm. So, members, um, the minutes of the last meeting, on the 26th of March, if members are content, I'll sign them yeah. into the record. Agreed? Agreed. Members agreed, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, members, we're going to go into agenda item um, 10, under uh, which is at pages 16 to 48 of your packs um, on the annual theft and fraud report 2012 2013. And we have um, Alison Codwell of DFP is with us today uh, to report on the annual theft and fraud report. You're very welcome, Alison. Um, apologies for just firing you in to the seat. Um, members, that's at pages four, 16 to 48 in your packs. Um, the report provides an analysis of the data provided by the department to DFP of cases of suspected and proven uh, fraud, including attempted fraud. Alison is with us here today to address any of the questions that members may have or to provide further information as requested. So, Alison, you're, you're very, very welcome here today. Um, members, just in going over the um, report in Alison in, in 2009 and 2010, there were 177 cases reported. There was a bit of a sharp rise in 2010 to, and 2011 to 302, a 70% increase. Um, again, it rose considerably in 2011 to 12, where there was a 409 cases reported, uh, a slight increase of 35%. For this most recent report, there's been a slight decrease on this re most recent one. Um, the number reported of cases is 404. Given that the report is circulated annually to accounting officers, um, it's a bit alarming that numbers are so high and that inroads um, aren't being made to address those particular problems that are identified within the report. Okay. Um, Chair, may maybe just start with sort of saying that First of all, as you've already pointed out, these cases aren't just actual cases. When we report on them and when the departments provide us with the information, it is a snapshot at a time. And so we have a number of suspected and again, and indeed attempted and prevented cases. Um, and the purpose of the report is very much to try and learn lessons from that. We are quite clear in, um, and we, we, we want to be quite clear that we're not saying this is the only fraud or even inaccurate. It, it is the best estimate that we can give mm -hmm. um, within, within the departments based on what is reported to us. And it obviously doesn't take account of social security agency fraud, etc., which is included. But to go back to your, your point um, as to the increase, I think there's a couple of factors that I could point to that might explain some of that increase. In 910, we actually renamed the report the Annual Theft and Fraud Report, and I think that very action actually did um, convey to departments that we wanted cases of theft um, rather than perhaps what was seen as a bit more complex than mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. In 1011, we also started to include the Department of Justice cases after devolution of policing and justice. And at the same time, whereas previously we had reported uh, DARD, the agriculture, um, had provided us a separate input, um, they actually, their, their level of cases was diminishing and it was determined that they should be just part of the overall report. Um, the other factors that I think we could point to uh, was the increase in metal and oil fuels during that, that period. That certainly became much more of a trend and this report helped us to identify that. Um, so, so those are some of the factors, but I could also say that you know, fraud, the cases that we will be reporting will, will vary from, from year to year. Um, and um, no doubt that maybe perhaps the economic climate that we're in at the current time has also yeah. contributed to the increase. So while I wouldn't want to say it's reassuring that we're, we've plateaued this year because I would, wouldn't like to guess what next year's figures will, will say, that might explain some of the increase. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Um, 
Paragraph um, 2.2 of the report, as you alluded uh, earlier, does welcome uh, the mentions a reduction in theft of assets cases, including the reduction in fuel and metal theft that you alluded to. However, the number of health service specific cases has increased by 50% um, and payment process related cases are more than four times what they were in the previous report. Uh, th this, would you see that as a worrying development? Um, well, in terms of the health service specific, obviously that's for the, the Department of, of Health. Uh, and I know that they have taken some measures from what has been relayed to us through the Fraud Forum. Um, they very much, uh, members may be aware, have carried out a Fraud Awareness Month last, um, last year. And I think really it just the, the increase in numbers that we're seeing being reported to us perhaps re reflects the additional attention that the Department of Health is actually given to this. Those cases include cases where um, scripts, prescriptions are, are either stolen or amended or where the wrong person claim turns up trying to obtain the, the drugs. Um, they also relate to cases um, where perhaps the individual is not entitled um, to medical treatment within, or free medical treatment within Northern Ireland. In terms of the increase in payment process related, um, a couple of sort of types of fraud fall into that. One key one would be where um, people actually ring up departments or agencies, NDPBs, um, reporting to be the supplier and asking for their bank account details um, to be changed in order that payments can be diverted and we have seen um, an increase in that and as a result of that we have um, issued uh, and indeed reissued guidance on that, that area. Okay, okay. Members, um, I'm sure you've had time to, to read the report uh, in itself. Uh, it goes on to discuss uh, initiatives in terms of how to tackle fraud and theft and to provide more detail on case numbers. Um, their, their, their value and um, the bodies on reporting these cases, information on perpetrators, the causation of cases, the method of discovery and the actions to improve controls. Section 4 provides an analysis of the main categories of the cases reported and Section 5 does take a specific look at uh, SSA benefit fraud and NIE cases of dumping of illegal waste, which is an issue in, in some areas uh, at present. Um, of a few members, Alison, looking to come in here, is that okay, Sean, you wanted yeah. to? It was to do there, particularly what, what the Chair first was talking about, was table, was, was page 13, and the concerning uh, in that table there that, that actually organisations, their ability to detect fraud and do something about it seems to be very, very, very low. Um, you know, when you look at that column, attempted but prevented, it's quite small. You know, so in terms of the mechanisms within the various organisations, there's certainly a lot to be done in terms of detecting the fraud and dealing with it. Just more a comment than anything else. Okay, thank you, Sean. Alison, do you want to? Well, in terms of that, I think you know certainly the, the figures that we have before us there do do show that attempt to prevent it is perhaps lower. One reason for that may be we sometimes hear that things have been caught on, but it's actually not considered to be a, necessarily a fraud and therefore not reported to us. But in all of these cases, and you know, if I could give members a flavour, some of the things that are reported in the theft of assets categories, they are quite low value. Um, and so while we can put in place good fraud policies, fraud response plans, fraud training, there does come a time when it would be disproportionate to put in place all the controls that would absolutely prevent any level of theft and fraud being perpetrated. Um, if I could give an example, the, the, the theft of foodstuffs out of a fridge is just one example of a case. So, you know, the cost of actually controlling that would outweigh maybe even the loss. So, in our guidance, we are clear that management um, must take a proportionate approach to managing the risk of fraud in the same way as they would with any other fraud. But that's not to say that they shouldn't put in place um, controls that, first of all, try and prevent fraud, but secondly, detect it, investigate it, and sanction it where it does, it does occur. And just a follow up on that, Chair. Um, in terms of the policies and practice, are they frequently then monitored and evaluated? 
Yeah, we, we have our own Managing the Risk of Fraud Guide, which is like a high-level policy document. Um, that was updated in 2011 and has been um, circulated around all departments. Um, all departments would have their own fraud policies and response plans that would then be the responsibility of departmental or uh, agency organisation management to actually look at those on a regular basis and to make sure that they are appropriate. Um, uh, and a lot of that is, is perhaps done through the, the audit committees that are in place where they would have maybe a sp specific interest in fraud in terms of overall governance arrangements. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, okay, thank you, Sean. Members, um, have you any other questions or comments on, on the report? No? Alison, thank you very much. I, I know it's been, it's been brief and... Um, uh, thanks again for coming to the committee uh, to present the report to us. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members, um, we're going to go into closed session for a few moments. Um, we've been given some information just that we want to discuss in closed session. Is that turned off? Yeah. Room 29. Yes, good to go. <laughs> look happy, look grumpy. Okay. Yeah. You're not surprised, I suppose. Members are very welcome. Apologies for the delay. Um, we've just been given sight of this here and we had to have a five minutes to glance over it. So apologies for, for the slight delay. Um, we're in open session, yes. Yep, members. Um, you're very welcome, um, Sir George Bain, Mr McDowell and Mr Cheever. You are very welcome to our meeting here today. Um, I'm going to just set out the context um, because obviously we're in Hansard and the public will be listening in. So I just want to set out the context on, on where, where we're at today. Um, members, we've already discussed this issue in previous meetings and agreed to have a general running order for the session. Um, uh, I will speak first, followed by the deputy chairperson, and then we'll open it to members in an order of their indication of their, with their line of questions. Um, and before we begin, I'd like to take the opportunity to give some background to the session for the benefit of the public who are watching. And, um, on the 13th of November uh, 2013, the committee launched a report which concluded its inquiry into DECAL's management of major capital projects. And we considered a number of venues here in the north, as with all, all, all our inquiries. We looked into this aspect of DECAL's work to see if value for money uh, was. So on publication of our report, there was a lot of media interest, particularly in relation to the section that looked at the Lyric Theatre redevelopment project. So I just want to preface this se session with a specific recognition that the Lyric Theatre is a landmark on the Lagan, uh, with a reputation, as we said previously, as a world-class theatre. <coughs> and that volunteering in the arts is a very valuable and rewarding activity for both the volunteers and for the cultural fabric of our society. The committee is in no doubt, no doubt that the Lyric uh, is a truly fantastic venue, which is an asset that we, we are all extremely proud of, and those from the theatre who worked long and hard in designing this building and raising a lot of money to contribute towards it, towards the redevelopment programme, should be proud of the outcome of it. It is for this reason that Mr McDowell's interviews on the 13th of November 
came as such a shock to the members of this committee um, and the comments made during the interviews. And that is what has led us to ask Mr McDowell to come to the committee here today. Um, the comments indeed um, were of great interest and concern to uh, our committee here, given that there was issues um, that were alluded to in terms of inaccuracies um, and the fact that maybe the, these inaccuracies could have been brought to the fore during the process, either prior to the approval of the audit report or during the PAC inquiry. So we were concerned that some of the suggestions that there were some disreferences within the process followed by this committee, and in the course of this committee carrying out its inquiry and the conclusions we reached in our report were consequently inaccurate. We as a committee conducted this inquiry as we do any other inquiry and are concerned that their papers or sorry, that there appears to be a lack of confidence in our findings and indeed in the processes that we follow. With this in mind, uh, uh, Mr McDowell has accepted our invitation to come here today um, along with Sir George and Mr Cheevers um, to help us assist us in identifying where the procedural uh, problems were in our inquiry and where the inaccuracies that Mr McDowell alluded to in our conclusions exist as a result of this. So um, basically the work of this committee obviously was in question and that is why we are here today. So I'll start my question um, to Mr McDowell. Um, Mr McDowell, in terms of the uh, project, can you explain, uh, in your opinion, why you think it was delivered within budget and to specification, and not one penny of public money was wasted in that exercise? But, however, I understand that public sector pr approval was based upon a business case which estimated that the project would cost £12.4 million. The project then ended up costing £17.8 million and this resulted in the public sector contribution uh, increasing from £6 million to £12.2 million. So I would be grateful if you could explain to the committee why a project originally estimated uh, cost of 12.4 ended up costing £17.8 million. Well, first of all, thanks, Chairperson, for your welcome and for the invitation to come along. Um, we welcome the opportunity to be here in order to respond to the um, damaging allegations made uh, in the PAC report and the even more damaging uh, allegations that were made in the associated um, press release. It was as a consequence of the publication of the PAC report and the associated press release that the Lyric Theatre was faced with a veritable tsunami of media inquiries looking for a response about this, to this report. But little attention, if any, appeared to be focused in the press release in particular on any of the other decal capital projects. And so we were deeply upset at what the committee's report was saying about a project which we knew was an exemplar one. It was finished on time, it was finished on budget, and it was finished to at least the specification that was required. And that's something to be immensely proud of. And we didn't, during that process, go to the Arts Council or DECAL or any other body for a bailout because we couldn't deliver what we said we could. And um, I was the senior responsible owner on that project. And uh, my reaction on that day to the publication of the report was because I felt that my personal reputation was being impugned by the headline criticism, which was being repeated in countless news reports. I felt strongly about the unfounded, unsubstantiated criticism of a project in which I and others had invested so much of my time 
in my personal financial investment. Can, can I just... Uh, can I, can, I know you haven't answered the question you asked about the progress yeah. up until a particular point. Yes. But the position is that when the contract was approved by government, the, 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 we received approval to proceed. That's when we were in control of the sequence of events and no loss of control resulted. Um, Mr McDowell, I, I mean, in terms you alluded to your personal yes. reputation being impugned. Yes. yes. There was nowhere in the report that that had alluded to your personal reputation being impugned. No. You also suggest that there was damning allegations within the report, yeah. or report, the report that this committee prepared and presented to the public was a fact. So the, I, I don't understand where you would believe that there was damaging allegations within that report. So if, I mean, uh, my, how, dam how my damaging do you think it is to issue a press release which refers to the project for which I was the senior responsible owner? Mr. McDowell, you rigged and manipulated. You, 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 you're It wasn't bored. rigged and manipulated. There's no evidence. This, this man has been here to ask questions today yes. and answer questions. Now, he's talking about his reputation being impugned. Every one of our reputations has been impugned by the allegation that this man went to the BBC with, where he said that we may have more experience of a different kind in terms of rigging. Now, that's our reputations have been impugned. Mm -hmm. I would like to get to the questions mm -hmm. so that we can try and find out, drill down into this report to find out what has been wrong with the report. This is not an, an opportunity for Mr Madol to come here today and put his own glossary on this. This is an opportunity for him today to answer questions that we're going to put to him and him for to answer those. Absolutely. Mr McDowell, if I can just go back. Your board did have an opportunity to comment on the report well before you went on radio interview. Uh, we have a letter here dated the 31st of January uh, uh, from the lyric from, from Mr McCauley uh, in terms of the draft report within the decal project. Um, there is nowhere in this letter that we have from Mr McCauley that says that there was damning allegations within, within our report. You did have time to comment on the report and you did not. You didn't take the opportunity. Why? Hmm. Well, uh, I don't know. I certainly wasn't uh, given an opportunity to comment on the report, but uh, on the other hand, uh, by the time the uh, report was done, I was no longer a trustee uh, of the Lyric. But, uh, Chair, you say your report is based completely on factual uh, matters. Uh, you have before you a short statement that I made. If you look in paragraph one, the second uh, sentence, it says, at the same meeting at which the project board approved the fixed price contract with the preferred bidder, it was agreed that the preferred bidder would become patrons of the Lyric Theatre with a donation of 150000 That is not a fact. It is a factual error. Because, as you can see by going down, the approach to uh, Gilbert Ash for a gift, which would be a normal thing to do after a successful bid of that kind, uh, occurred after, not at the same meeting, not before the meeting. So if you just want one fact, which particularly affects me, because the report is implying an effect, that whoever asked Gilbert Ash for the donation, and it was me, in effect was saying to Gilbert Ash, or implying, that if they gave us 150000 well, they would get the contract. The contract had already been awarded. Sir George, the same contract price agreement and the 150k donation were recorded in the minutes of the same project board meeting of the 27th of October. They were. This confirms factual accuracy of the report. Obviously. No, it doesn't, Chair. The reason they may have been confirmed is that uh, I, three days later, announced publicly, because I was very proud, very delighted, to have got us to the 95% point, which is what is required by decal, etc. And I'm not the brightest guy in the world, but I don't think I'm the stupidest either. I wouldn't go to a project board and announce publicly at a board at which we had decal, CPD, and the Arts Council that I had this gift if there was anything wrong about it. Indeed, since people often like to give money anonymously, and we did receive anonymous gifts, one of 200,000, much greater than Gilbert Ashes. Why, if this was underhand, would we have publicly shouted from the rooftops that Gilbert Ash had given this gift? 
philosophy. But I mean, the factual error is that, as you can see from the sheet. Obviously, the perception that it gave out there was the case. I think most uh, conflict of legal interest. processes don't work on perceptions, they don't work on impressions, they work on evidence. At least they should. Yeah. The department actually observed themselves that there was a conflict. Which department? Interest. The decal department, Department of Culture, Arts and Leisure. Well, I don't. They, they alluded themselves, and I'll just quote. The department's observation that conflict of interest arrangements were not adequate in this case and that a better conflict of interest process should have been in place in a third party organisation in receipt of government money. Well, the um, press release that I have from DECAL uh, actually is saying the following. The press release accompanying the committee's report made the following comment. Um, and they go on to say, with a strong impression that the outcome had been rigged. The Department of Art and the Arts Council need to be much more robust, etc. But what they're saying is that if such evidence exists, this would suggest that a breach of the public contracts regulations may have taken place. Therefore, if the committee yourselves is aware of such evidence, the department would respectfully like to have it because this information suggests that an appropriate investigation should be undertaken. So I do not uh, know the document you're quoting from, but certainly DECAL does not accept on the basis of this that uh, there's a conflict of interest. And indeed, they were at the meeting uh, at which the, um, the announcement was made. Well, at the same meeting at which the project board approved the fixed contract with the preferred bidder, no, it it no. Was agreed Person, the project the board did not approve the fixed contract at that meeting. It didn't? No. It's, uh, it's accurate, the fact that it did. Uh, I think the sight of the minutes uh, I think is mm -hmm. important here uh, because the, the minutes did uh, reflect, it. reflect both things, mm -hmm. uh, both the award of the tender and uh, donation. Uh, no, I think. No, the, minutes, the minutes could not have re reflected the award of the tender. They indicate that um, the IDM has required a period of time mm -hmm. to examine what was then being put forward, including mm -hmm. the final contract price which had been put forward by the contractor. Mm -hmm. You have got it wrong, Mr Donnelly. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, in uh, your audit office report, dealing with the specific question of donation, you make reference in a paragraph to a target contract price having been determined. That is of no relevance to myself as the senior responsible owner or to the IDMs. What was the only thing you could go on was something in writing from the contractor saying we will build this building for that price. That was on the 22nd of October. Until then, Sir George could not have approached this contractor, because that would have been quite wrong, it would not satisfy any considerations of propriety and materiality. And that happened on the 24th when Sir George went to meet Gilbert Ash. And we then reported on the following Monday, three days later, to the project board that that had been secured and that we also had a final contract price from the contractor. But there was no approval given because that would have to be examined by the IDMs and CPD. But you did not reference the 22nd of October. You did not reference the 24th of October. I think you the referenced fact, the target contract. I do not believe the fact earlier. remains, you know, that there was agreed with DECAL and provided to the Lyric during clearance. The fact is there, and it's in the minutes, and it which, reflects which, which it. Which fact, Chairperson? Yeah. To the chairperson, but it's been clear. I, I think an easier way to do this, because I mean, I think we're we're going in reverse here. If I actually look at the process, and I think we should, the sooner we start the process in terms of the process of awarding the contract and get into that process and those figures, I'll be interested to see what Mr. Madol's mm -hmm. comments are there and how others were. Where how meetings were rearranged, short notes and stuff like that, which we all draw our own conclusions from. But I think the sooner we get into those facts, the better. Okay, um, Adrian, your Our next questions. Yeah. Chairperson, I ask more or less the same questions you asked because I don't think you've got an answer at all. No, it was a rant mm -hmm. you got there, and that was no no answer to a question. So I want to know 
After the first business case was presented, there was two addendums presented after that. One that took the, the cost of the project up to from 12.5 million to 15.3 million. The second addendum took it up on further up then to 17.8 million. Now uh, this was presented to, for DFP approval. But I have it true to say that DFP expressed concern that the cost increased and were reluctantly approved back there. Mm. And would you acknowledge uh, that as well? That more realistic cost of 17.8 million had been sent to the public sector from the outset. I'm sorry, I missed the last point. Well, would you, would you agree that if 17.8 million pounds had been presented to the public sector from the outset, this project may not have received public sector approval? Well, I could it have been presented at the outset. But you, you, you presented it shortly after. There's two amendments. The then was to the shortly afterwards. No, I mean, there's uh, still, but it's still, it's still res from 12.5 million to 17.8 million pounds. Uh, uh, the cost, the cost of the project. Not, not denying it, Mr. McCullough. Well, um, can you tell me? Do you believe that if it was presented at the start at the cost of 17.8 million pounds, would have got approval? You, you're, you're shaking your head, Mr. Bain. You think it would have? Well. I'll let uh, people who I didn't, uh, as I'm trying to make clear, I was not involved to any great extent. I'm responsible, of course, having been on the board. Yeah. But I was not involved in the technical side of it, but, uh, simply because that's not my specialty. Well, my I'm, specialty I'm was the question. But I'll the question. I think then. the simple point was that, why well, I think they might have, is that unlike most of the contracts that you've reviewed, of the seven total, we did not simply put our hand out, as people always seem to do, and expect the government to fill it. Myself and my team who were on the development front went out and aggressively approached and fundraised and ended up raising over 30 percent of the total from private sources. This was not like some of the contracts, sorry, some of the projects you look at were 100 percent funded by the government, some were 95 percent funded. We went out and raised it. So I think the simple point is, and I'll leave it to Phil and to Sid to answer uh, about why it went from 12 to 17 or 18 or whatever, but the simple point is that we always felt that we had, to a large extent, our own future in our hands because we were not expecting the government simply to uh, pay for the whole shot or indeed, as happened with at least one of those other projects, bail it out at the end because it had not raised it. Well, 17.8 million pounds was a 68% cost to the public. You know, but, you know that was our 12.2 million pounds, which was significant more than it started off at because the original mm -hmm. pot of money to the public was going to cost six million pounds. So actually, 68% more. Uh, there's no quarrel with uh, those figures, Mr. Uh -huh. uh But the the process from the time at which a design competition took place, which is really very much really talking about only outline uh, drawings. Uh, until we got to a stage where we had raised this very high threshold that was unique to our project. 95% of the funding had to be in place. Now, from, 19, from 2003 up until uh, 2007, Eight, seven. Uh, when we were uh, putting that information to the project board, this was a period of enormous increases in, in, in price, cost, well, and we had no control over that. We had been set this objective of getting this money, but it was a hell of a, a task to do it. I mean, there's a reference in uh, Mr Donnelly's report and his press release to the fact that no uh, completion date was set. But how could you know in advance when you're going to raise such a, a fundamentally important sum of money, almost £6 million? We weren't, that wasn't in our gift. It was a question of going out and doing your damnedest to get that money. Mm. And during that period of time, we had the economic um, you know, heating up of the economy, the house prices going through the roof, <coughs> builders' prices going up. And, and, so and we, we were Mr. McDowell, can I... And I just want to finish on this point, Chairperson. From the point at which... We had control of this project and the budget. Not a penny extra was spent or asked for. Yeah, but that was whenever it was agreed at 17.8 million pounds. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but, you know, I didn't agree that price. Uh -huh. the, the, the departments uh, agreed that price for whatever reason. Uh, and if they hadn't agreed it, we wouldn't have been able to go ahead and so be it. We would have had to live with that. And it, the case had to be made. It was made with the support of DECAL to, to DFP. And DFP, in that period between getting the final contract price and signing the contract, 
um, DFP asked questions, quite legitimate questions, about why this uh, donation towards uh, or this contribution towards um, the ground source heat or cooling system, why this uh, donation to a contribution towards uh, the project director costs. All of that quite legitimate. But if they said no, we wouldn't have been able to go ahead. No, no. I didn't agree with that. But, but would you, would you looking... agree with us as well that 68 per cent raised to the public purse was, yeah, was alarming for, or that was a figure that, that grabbed yeah. the, the headlines? Like. Yeah. Absolutely, Mr McQuillan, but it's for DFP to answer that. Mm -hmm. They approved this uh, and we were looking for it because we believed in the project. But when we were responsible, not a penny extra was spent. Well, I'll take you at your word on that. But well, that's the reality. Yes, well, I'm, I'm taking your word for it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Do you sorry. accept, um, Mr Bain, that it would have been... It's Sir George Bain. Uh, Sir, oh, yes. Sir George. I've been would... called worse. <laughs> <laughs> Do you accept... <laughs> Do you accept, sorry. Sir George, do you accept that it would have been better not to have the sponsorship from this same successful bidder? Absolutely not. Absolutely. Any competent fundraiser would immediately go to somebody who'd been successful uh, after you know winning the, after winning the contract and uh, ask them to put something back. It wouldn't have mattered who got it. I mean, uh, the critical thing is that so you, you don't do... believe that the public perception out there that it was a nod and a wink. I, I've never heard anybody say it was a nod and a wink because except that's, this committee. That's that's what the public. Well, the public why at the is, meeting on the uh, uh, the twenty seventh? When I went to the project board, the representatives there were DECAL, the Arts Council, and CPD. And they were ecstatic. And the reason they were ecstatic was, first of all, there's a rule, I gather, I think it's a very foolish rule, that a project like this could not proceed till 95% of the total cost is raised. For a fundraiser, that presents a difficulty because it's nice to get a project going and you can show people how it's developing and they're more likely to contribute. The significance of the Gilbert Ash gift was that it took us over the 95%. And uh, why, if people thought it was a nod and a wink, why did the representative from CPD, why did the representative from DECAL, why did the representative from the Arts Council not say something at that time? And if it was a nod and a wink, as I said earlier, why would I come and announce that the contractor had given us 150,000. But it's a why would I not simply have announced an anonymous what that looks like. We're not saying it was an odd knowing, but what we're saying is the perception of what it looked like. Well, it only looked like the perception, I think, to this committee. I've no, never heard no, until this. Nonsense. Well, it is not nonsense, Mr. It's nonsense. I have not heard anybody raise that. Why did a member of Mr. Donnelly's department, why did Decal, why did the Arts Council the, the not say, George, this perception, oh, goodness, we're going to be dragged through... The uh, department you know. has alluded to the fact that there was a complete conflict of interest, and I think Mr... There, there was no Clark, conflict of interest. The department has something else, there's something else for you, the department. So, excuse so there's me. a conflict. You said we were the only ones. The department themselves had said there was a conflict. They did not said it was so a conflict. So there's someone else for you. I just just read, this committee. There's someone else for you. Mr Clark, I just read out to you a statement from Decal saying... If the committee has evidence, as distinct from impressions, they would wish to receive it because what an effect the committee is accusing it is of criminal behavior. And they would what obviously you, wish, you, if you have the evidence, yeah, as distinct from an impression, let, let's go back to we a, ourselves let's, would let's like Let's go that. back to a question. We're saying it again, Mr. Clark. You can say it as long as you like. We're saying it again. Yeah. Yeah. And you can say as much as you like. Yeah. We'll say it too. But, but let's we're back. not guilty of anything. Did anybody say you were guilty of anything? Oh, no, yes. You have a strong impression. Mr. Well, take, take, it whatever way you wish. take it whatever way you wish, Mr. Well, Madol. The, the fact is, we're down this road let's, because Mr. Donnelly was very inadequate. Let's go back to the minutes. Let's, let's go back to the board minutes to where it was recorded at that actual board. Now, you have never disputed, disputed that in this report. You went on to, to criticise the members of this, this committee, but one of the points you didn't, because you probably weren't aware at the particular time, or maybe you didn't take time to read it, but in paragraph 4.24 says clearly that at the minute where this was agreed that Gilbert Ash was to get the contract, that the donation it was discussed. It doesn't say that. It does not say that. Do you want me to read it, it out to you? Well, even even want me to read it to you. What are you well, reading from, Mr. Clark? I'm reading from the report. You which you never, you never, you never Sorry, commented report? on that oh, portion of the report the in terms of the 150. Oh, the audit. Audit. By that stage, we're totally fed up with the activities of the Northern Ireland Audit Office. Uh, Isn't Mr. it a good job we have Mr. them? Mr. McDowell, it's a very good what? job we do have them. Mr. Yeah. McDowell, I, I have to give Mr. Donnelly the right of reply here. Um, uh -huh. You want to come uh, in? Uh, I want to say very clearly, producing my report, I'm absolutely clear there was a perception issue 
on conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. That was firmly registered in the report. Mm -hmm. uh, the Public Accounts but Committee... Not the, date, had, not the dates involved. Hold on. Not the dates involved. Yeah. That's just splitting hairs because uh, it's, <laughs> there is a perception issue here, and a serious one. That perception issue is now accepted by the parent department, irrespective of what was said at an earlier stage. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, yeah, there is absolutely. a point of principle here uh, when a successful bidder uh, is also making a donation. In my book, that's not acceptable. It's in the committee's in the, book, it's, it's not acceptable. In the industry. And, it's normal, and you say that in your report. You say that in your report. Mr. McDowell. Mr. McDowell. The, this committee did not say that the process was rigged and manipulated, but it did say that it was left with a strong impression that it was rigged and manipulated. And I just wanted to make can that I, can I, clarify. Pretty that. damaging. Pretty pretty damaging. damaging. Just, Whatever way you are. I haven't, I haven't spoken yet. Um, just I was part of the, uh, the, the Capital Working Group, which was the subcommittee of the board, and was involved in the process of, of the tender. Uh, George was on the same board uh, with others, and they were involved in the fundraising. Can I look, do, do nothing else and absolutely assure this committee that those two processes were completely independent, and there was, you know, th they were intentionally kept independent. The tender process, I can assure you, was not rigged in any way whatsoever, nor was it manipulated. It was done professionally by professional quantity surveyors and project managers. And, you know, the, 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 the suggestion that it was rigged or for the sake of £150,000, to me, is just absolutely ludicrous. We, we went through the process and we selected a contractor as preferred bidder in March. We worked with that contractor right through the whole summer season and the autumn season. And we got to a, um, an agreed price, an agreed fixed price of 13.2 million for the construction contract. And only after that offer was made mm -hmm. and agreed was Sir George uh, to go to mm -hmm. Gilbert Ash to talk to them about a possible donation. And that is my view. And that's, that's the way it happened. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Totally independent processes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Clark and then Alex. Mr. Shivers. So, so and, and, and thanks for that. But in terms of that process, you were involved in the process. So, in terms of, do we get to that particular stage? You were involved in all the tender evaluations. You would have been invited to those as a member of the board. I, I was, or if it wasn't you, who was it from the I area? was involved. We left. The, the detail of the process was carried out by RLB Ryder Livin yeah. Bucknell, um, a London company who we selected for their expertise, particularly in, in theatre projects. They actually yeah. had a a specialist division uh, uh, run by his name, John Burness was the, was the partner at the time. He has since retired, but Burgess, yes. Um, they, we, we, they, they carried out the tender assessments. No, they, no, no, issue, no issue with that. I mean, yeah, I appreciate sorry. they were involved in that part. But in terms of those assessments, or in terms of any of the meetings around those tender evaluation meetings, or any representations of those? Yes, so they were doing. Who yes. were they? It was myself and the then executive director, uh, Michael Diskin. Yeah, we'll go back to Mr. Shivers for a thing. Yeah. I, I much prefer your tone, Mr. Shivers. Yeah. But in terms of those meetings, so we now hear that we have representation from the Lyric on that. Given that CPD, in terms of the Department of Finance, have representation, would you, as an individual, find it odd that the date, the date of that meeting was rearranged at short notice, and CPD weren't at the meeting when the tender evaluation was done? Would you find that odd? Um, not, As any right-thinking person, not not, I don't, not necessarily. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't think it odd. I don't, so, I don't know so why. given so given, Mr. Shivers, that CPD bring that expertise in terms of the evaluation of contracts mm -hmm. and how these contracts should be awarded, and that there was a date set, and the date mysteriously was changed at very short notice, and then when the meeting was rearranged, <coughs> no one from CPD was there. You wouldn't find that peculiar, no? Well, look. I've been involved in the construction industry now for 30 years, and dates quite often are changed. Are yeah, absolutely. Last minute, it's 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 perfectly normal. Um, the and always rearranged at short notice. Uh, well, Usually, <laughs> for major contracts, it's it's not abnormal to have meetings are rearranged at short notice. That would be my personal view on the situation. But, but, but given the expertise, 
Mr. Clark, well. wouldn't it, though, in that case, be the uh, onus on CBD either? Because uh, in my life, meetings are being, and I'm sure in a politician's life, meetings are being changed yeah. at short notice all the time. And I think that's fair uh, comments from George. Yeah, but, but would it but, not have been uh, but, expected but, sorry, if CBD, CPD felt this was so important that they should have said, yeah. we can't make the meeting, and the meeting should not go ahead without it? Yeah, and I think they never said that. Yeah, I think that's fair comment. I, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying. It's not our right. job to make sure the CPD if, attends meetings. But if you let me speak now. Sorry. Um, and I think that's fair comment in terms of the point you make. CPD should have been there and they should have made comment on that. However, come back to what the chairperson said. You see, it's interesting that Sid Madol was jumping out to be the champion to defend the case for the lyric. However, the criticisms were not only about the lyric, it was also about CPD and others actually negating the responsibility for being at a tender evaluation. So it's from all those reasons why that you could draw a conclusion that some of this would have been rigged and manipulated because some people were absent. Now, whether they were CPD, whether, and I know other, other questioners want to ask questions on how we actually arrived at the figure, because there's a big variation in terms of the contract valuations. But whenever you look at that whole process, I mean, I don't think anybody has ever said that in terms of what we finished up with was excellent, but it's actually how we got from A to Z. And it's all that stuff in between. Now, if Sid <coughs> come out and have his run on radio, that's fine. But let's look at all works and all. So CBD, and I think this report is clear in terms of the responsibility they have, they have failed also. But this, this report, the audit office report that has been done, looks at from the start to the finish and everyone who's responsible or who's been irresponsible. And I suggest many have been irresponsible in terms of how this contract has been handled. Mr Clark, the date for the tender evaluation meeting was put back at the request of contractors who needed more time in order to complete their uh, tender submissions. That's all. Uh, their invitation was extended not only to CPD, whom we would have been happy to have there, um, but also to the department. The department were happy that uh, we should proceed with that. But what I think is significant, and this is where I think the, the committee has been led astray by this very poor audit office report. So, so we, have not, we have not been led astray. We are all. We are all. We may outside of politics. We have all. We, we, we all can think for ourselves. I've got a view on it. No, no. Well, I can. I've got a view on it. Well, you're not going to defame my name to suggest I've been led astray because I have been led astray by no one. Well, you didn't. I worry, satisfied you didn't myself. Worry about defaming my name. I satisfied. No, I didn't use your name. But I satisfied myself in terms of the audit office report. I satisfied myself in terms of decal sitting down at the end of the table, the Department of Finance sitting at the end of the table, and any of the other partners who wish to come and give evidence to this committee. So I can assure you now, Mr. Madol, I don't take everything that the audit office gives me as the gospel. Okay. I actually have my opportunity to scrutinise and ask questions, and I believe I'm capable of doing that. So I was not led astray. Okay. The fact of the matter is that um, the tender evaluation meeting could never have been a decision-making meeting. Could never have been a decision-making meeting. Okay. And so its significance... It, it, it may not have been a decision-making meeting, but it was discussing how you arrived at final value price. Now, I'm not going to steal the thunder in terms of the question of that from other members, but I think the general public themselves, if they knew the detail on how you arrived at that figure, will draw their own conclusion. Now, if you're concerned that people didn't think it was rigged and manipulated, I think if this level of the detail and the general public lift this particular portion where there's been five contractors and how there's been adjustments made and how contracts have been destroyed, I think the general public will come to their own conclusion. I'll, I'll let Mr McQuillan in and then just, Mr just Copeland. We point that Mr Chivers was saying there that, that you know, the meeting was arranged at short notice and on ahead and it was up to CPD to make sure somebody was there. But looking back at it now... You know, I think it would be better just hold it to, to keep the thing right for yourselves, that well, CPD what, would have been there. What, what I don't know uh, is, in terms of the meeting we prearranged, where did CPD not, just not turn up, or did they say, right, we, we can't make that meeting, we rearrange that for the next day or the following day? I don't, I don't actually know personally the answer to that. So I don't know the context in which the meeting was was rearranged. Mm -hmm. I can't answer that. Well, if, if you could maybe find that information out, I'd be happy to, if you'd pass it on to the committee, I'd be happy to know that. It's reflected in the papers, Mr McQuillan, that the CPD uh, client advisor had uh, arranged leave 
and therefore couldn't make the rearranged date. Yes. And also the correspondence, I think, that you managed to us, it shows that there was no one else available from CPD to be fielded on that day. But C CPD was an important player in this whole process. Absolutely. And looking back at it now, it would be better Absolutely. just saying, look, we can hold off on all week till your guy comes back from leave or whatever. Except the point I make is that there was never any possibility of that meeting being a decision-making meeting. There was ample opportunity afterwards for any questions or reservations to be raised. I'm just saying, before. perception again, perception looking back. And, and just to clarify, CPD did give notice that they couldn't attend th right. that meeting. Uh, that's fact. That's yep. on record. Yeah. Yeah. So why did it go ahead? So, so it would be better to oh, look back at it. It would be better to say, well, we'll hold on to CPD's there. Well, they're a key player and they're better there because they, they exactly. are from the centre of procurement expertise. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're the guys who are providing you with the, advice, uh, the proper advice okay, to yes. mm -hmm. they procure the, the, the same contract. Way. The only uh, safeguard uh, Woman have as SRO in protecting the interests of the IDMs as well as the Lyric was that there was no way in which that meeting could be a decision-making meeting. Couldn't be. Thank you. Mr uh, Copeland? Sorry, yeah, thank you. I take it this is a supplementary to, to this rather than my own Yeah, questions. and then you're moving into your question then. Yeah. Uh, Sir George, forgive me because this is detailed and it's complicated to a degree. I just want to get it right in my own head. You were charged with raising a proportion of money privately, and that well, not just privately, privately, but, but from uh, and also public. I, uh, yeah, yeah, I accept that. And that amount of money had to be expressed as an actual amount of money and as a percentage of the overall contract price. Is that correct? That is correct. I mean, I didn't realise it when I took the job on, but uh, either decal or CPD or somebody requires that before a green light is given mm -hmm. for a project to proceed that you have 95% of the money in the bank, so to speak. 95% of, of, of the total money. The well, money. actually, it's a very good point, Mr. Copeland. I mean, when we finally got to that meeting, there's a little bit of ambiguity because there's various prices. You know, do we include this? Do we include mm -hmm. that? But basically, uh, in the end, we were speaking from memory about 96% or something like that. But basically, without getting into the decimal points, uh, they will not let you proceed until you've got 94% of the total cost of the project. Uh, the total anticipated cost or the total end cost? I know you no, the total, no, the total, well, anticipated. And as Sid said, you can argue about when the, the final thing. When I joined, I was told, George, all you got to do is raise 12 million. It eventually became 18 million. <laughs> no, I understand so that. But it was that figure. It was, it was uh, 95%, uh, just to be absolutely accurate, of uh, the, well, it would be of the construction cost. It was 19%, uh, 95% uh, of uh, the figure I have here is 17.8 million. I just asked a wee question, I mean, just put on money. Did any of uh, the contractors who tendered for the job give you a donation as well? Uh, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. But I mean, I, I've been dealing, I mean, there were six months from the point in March where, um, in March, where uh, Gilbert Ash was the only contractor in the game. It was the, uh, you know, I think Patton also, uh, I think Patton also may have given a gift, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't involved in that one. But, and, and forgive my cynical East Belfast man. <laughs> at, at the time that the gift was made, the contract had been awarded to Gilbert Ash. In other words, that came, the, 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 the 150,000 came afterwards. That's right. It's the two dates here, paragraphs four and five. Yeah, I understand that. So just on a little point of accuracy, it came after Gilbert Irish had submitted their final contract right. offer price. Okay. okay. But at that stage, it would be true to say, again, forgive my cynicism, I'm not trying to read anything into it, the project actually couldn't have proceeded unless the 150,000 had come from them or somewhere else. That was the trigger that allowed the thing to go ahead. Well, uh, again, it certainly was the thing that removed any doubt, yes. Right. Okay, excellent. It removed any doubt. Okay. Um, now, uh, again, chronology, excluding dates, but just a, a, a flow chart as I understand it. Um, Gilbert Ash initially submitted the most expensive tender. That's agreed. An adjustment was made to remove or discount scaffolding costs, and Gilbert Ash, from that exercise, seemingly benefited from £413,000 reduction in their tender price. That was the second phase. A further second adjustment was made 
and this case further in this case further costs amounting to three hundred and forty eight thousand were stripped out of the Gilbert Ash tender. But none of the other tenders that were on the table at that time were adjusted. And it would seem on paper that Gilbert Ash benefited from that to a substantial degree, right, rightly or wrongly. And I understand contracts and how these processes how these processes work. The evaluation meeting, which is the, the, the crucial one it seems, um, and we've already accepted that CPD, who in my view were um, very lacking in their exercise of uh, uh, their, their responsibilities, but um, uh, they weren't represented. Gilbert Ash was ranked number one in terms of quality, which is a different thing to cost. That was subsequently combined with the rankings of the adjusted pricers, and Gilbert Ash was ranked number two overall. Okay, my understanding of it. One final adjustment was made, and at that time, increased the cost. At that time, the increased cost of the tender ranked number one, and that resulted in Gilbert Ash going from fifth, fifth to the first. Now, again. My East Belfast cynicism would say that's a convenient sequence of events, and it may well have some exceedingly good reasons for that being the case. But it does look odd. Well, Mr. Copeland, I, as I've said from the beginning, uh, the fundraising was completely oh, separate no, no, from I, that. I accept that. And I think it's Phil that it. probably has to deal um, with that uh, one. And the, the, the question, Phil, really is, in summary, there were three adjustments to price, all of which appeared to benefit Gilbert Ash, and that did factually result in what was originally the most expensive tender becoming the successful tender. Yes. Um, without, uh, just if we can ignore the details of the numbers mm -hmm. for, for, for the moment, when we set out uh, at the beginning, there was a clear scoring procedure both on, uh, on the price side you follow the National Committee or whatever it is of uh, selection of tenders. Uh, if you're the, the, the National Joint uh, Consultative Committee for Building. And there's a code of procedure for correcting or correcting misunder I'll call them misunderstandings in tenders. And it's, again, RLB um, thought, or it was their opinion, that there were inconsistencies in the tenders returned. Mm -hmm. um, Gilbert Ash had an allowance of 400 odd thousand pounds, at, from one extreme 400 something thousand pounds for scaffolding, and another contractor had it included 84,000 80, pounds. Now, RLB concluded that obviously those were not, you're not getting the same for 80,000 pounds as you're getting for 400,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, they have decided, uh, in accordance with the procedure, to exclude the cost of, to t not to exclude it, to remove the cost of the scaffolding in order to, create a level to fairly assess the tenders in terms of equalising them or comparing apples with apples, if you like. Um, and that was, I think that was, that was the major adjustment. The other adjustments were really in accordance with 348,000. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm looking for your 300,000 pounds in the tender report and I, I, I can't yeah. actually See, find the, it. The, the, um, the, the issue in some of these things is um, so we base our report on the audit office report and the audit office report is, a, is based on factual information that's available. And the difficulty that I have in some respects is um, DECAL, the Arts Council, CPD, none of these groups were able to provide us with any explanations of the adjustments because the tendering documentation had been destroyed at the time when the contract was awarded. Well, that's now, hardly our fault. Well, I'm, okay. I'm not apportioning blame. I'm simply we, stating, the, stating the fact. It, 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 now, it, it is normal in accordance, again, with the procedure. I, I don't know if the information was destroyed or not, but the procedure says that once you've selected a contractor, you return the tender documents to, to the unsuccessful exactly. bidders. And that's... Exactly. I presume that so procedure was followed. If, I can't if, if there is a degree of conclusion drawn on this, it can, it can be explained in some respects by a sequence of events, none of which in themselves is particularly interesting mm -hmm. until it develops into a, into a pattern or, or into a trail. And you must forgive us for doing our job here. 
um, the amounts of money are colossal. Colossal. And yeah. in my constituency, I have some individual citizens being driven to the point of insanity for an overpayment of £380 in housing benefit. So we must discharge, whether we like it or not, our, and exercise our responsibilities as, as, as best we can. But I do find it strange that the company that you have, uh, RLG, which may be expert in um, awarding and guiding the procurement of projects like this, but it's not expert to the degree where it concurs with the normal parameters of acceptable behaviour and appears to have destroyed the, the, its well, paper trail I think, almost immediately. I think we, 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 this was a two-stage tender um, where you appoint a contractor uh, as a preferred bidder um, based on a cost plan analysis, so all the contractors have the same cost plan cost, which is, which is the cost of the works, mm. and then onto that cost they add their preliminaries, which are all their site huts and site staff mm. and scaffolding, for example, um, and on to which they add a, a percentage for overheads and profit, which I think was declared in this tender report some between about 3%, maybe up to, to 5%. So the, the, the RLB identified this uh, misunderstanding, if we can call it that, for the moment in the analysis of the prelims. Now, what they will have judged, and I, I am involved in the building industry myself, what they will have judged is that it would have been the intention of the contractor who put a low price on scaffolding to include the cost of that scaffolding in the works package for, let's say, brickwork or windows or whatever it may be. And the intention of RLB was to have all the scaffolding included in the prelims. So, Different contractors were, were using different tender strategy, if you like, to, to price those items, or it was a misunderstanding, or it was a misinterpretation. But in order to compare them, the simple thing to do was to write to each contractor, which they did, and say, right, we're going to remove our requirement for scaffolding. You tell us how much to take out. And I think there, in, somewhere in the papers, there, there's letters back from Farns and H&J and, and Patton's advising RLB how much money to take out. So then they went through, the, again, in accordance with the procedure. They removed the cost of the scaffolding out of the tender and then were able to compare the tenders and make an award. The actual cost of the scaffolding, whether it's in the prelims or whether it's in the brickwork or the window package, would have had to have been incurred by the Lyric Theatre, the, the scaffolding that had to be Ultimately paid for. it was, because so, the amount of 418000 whatever it was, won't yeah, be in. The, the, the cost doesn't disappear. It, it disappeared in terms of allowing a fair analysis of the tender, but the cost is still there. So the, the tenders were analysed in accordance with the procedure, and I've been through this, and I'm, I'm, I'm still comfortable that RLB have gone you know, through this procedure. Now, there's a quality aspect as well, which you quite rightly referred to, which Gilbert Ash scored quite high on. I have to say, Mr. Chief, I appreciate the comfort, but the, the issue is that the documentation of, that justified those decisions and that created the paper trail isn't available. I, I understand that. Yeah. I can't. I can't. The, 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 I'm not, I'm not um, asking you to. Yeah. But it's, it's, you, 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 sorry, Mr. McDowell. No, no, no. no, no, no. You, okay. you've, you've been around the block in the public sector. You know the importance of paper. Absolutely, and absolutely. Could, could, could I I'd try to help uh, by offering some further information? Yes. Everything that the Lyric was doing in connection with this procurement process had to be done in accordance with procedure. And that procedure was notified to the five organisations that were going to tender. Uh, uh, Mr Donnelly will have acquainted the committee with that procedure although I don't see it attached to any of the documentation. Chair Perrin, just on that, just on that point that Mr Waddell is making, I mean, and we're talking about the procedure, and we're talking about what Phil said, let's go back to Phil's point. If you don't mind me here, Michael. No, no, no the point. So, so let's, let's look at this guide again that Phil, you're referring to. Um, and I think you said in the guide then that the tender should be returned to contractors. That's what, that's what the guidance says. Well, yeah. in this case... So, so th that's what the guidance says. The guidance also, what you're saying is, which I find strange, but I mean, I'll, I'll take you at your word because if you're in the building trade, you would obviously know and you've got the guidance. But the guidance also said that it's, it's acceptable to remove 
these other places for scaffolding, for example. So, so, there's, so that, there's, there's a procedure for adjusting. Yeah. And you say removing, like there, there was. I'm just. There well, was it was removed. It was removed to move them from fifth no, no, position no, no. to third. But how about adjustment? Uh, uh, you can adjust prices up and down. Yeah. And in fact, one of the other contractors so, said so, on that put the price so up. So we'll follow the process. So uh, that it's acceptable to adjust, albeit that it can. It can come out with, a, as it did in this case, a peculiar result. But anyway, so we've adjusted a variation of 413,000 between that and 85,000. So we're following this guide. Then in your admission, the guide sends also then at the end of that process, the tender documents are returned. What we have learned from the documents that we have was that they actually the documents were destroyed by the private uh, section, sorry, the private sector consultants who were working on behalf of this. So we'll follow the guide correctly on some of it, but we'll throw the guide out on the rest of it, because very promptly after the award was made, the tender documents are destroyed. It would have been useful to get seeing these tender documents in their detail, because we, then we could have satisfied ourselves. But again, this is where this suggestion, or where someone might think that things have been rigged and manipulated. Because, I mean, if you actually follow the course of events, and no disrespect to Gilbert Archer and the other contractors, but if you go in for a contract and you put in a price, and, and this is a wee, bit, a wee bit concerned in terms of RBL, why they would concern themselves about the variation in prices in terms of what one contractor suggests will it take to do for scaffolding versus another. But it's very clear, looking at the original tenders, that Gilbert Ash was in fifth place. And by stripping out or removing or setting aside, maybe setting aside might be better, because it right. took out the 413,000. The other contractor who was actually in first place took out his 84,000, which moved him into second place, and Gilbert Ash at this stage plummets him into third place. And then there's further adjustments. But it's actually as you look at the tender documents, and I think this is why CPD have failed. I mean, I mean Mr. Madol seems to have taken exception. It was only the lyric as the target here, and the worst CPD have failed because they should have been present at this meeting. This should never have happened in the form that it did. The end result is that we've got a lyric there, and we've got the result we have in terms of the price. Well, but any right-thinking person has to draw a conclusion that if you've got a process, you either follow the process, you don't follow it for the half the bits you want, and then take the other bits out where it's going to suggest, well, we don't really want anybody to see these as the private sector consultants, so let's destroy these rather than send them back to the contractors. Because it would have been very good if we could actually went to the other four contractors and said, give us the documents. But they weren't in receipt of the documents. Yeah, I Destroyed by the private sector consultants working on behalf of this contract. Yeah. Personally, I do not know what happened to the other contractors' tender documents. Well, I'm telling you what happened to well, them. Well, Your consultants destroyed them. Well, yeah. There, there, there may be good reason for that. Yeah, there would be. But there, was, there, there may be good reason. There was, there was no manipulation of the tender process by the Eric. There was no need for RLB. Yes, and I, I'm glad you said that, Mr. Shivers, because when I, when I read the report, we're not saying the Eric manipulated no, no, it. No, the process has been manipulated. No, it, I, I don't, I don't think it has actually. And when I read back through RLB's report and the way they dealt with the contractors in terms of writing to them and the contractors writing back and agreeing the adjustments. Yes. I feel that the process has been followed. Um, Bits of it? Uh, well, no, I do feel the process has been followed. I would so, also so, what, so what's your response to the, the, the fact that the private sector consultants destroyed the documents if they followed the process? I, I just can't comment on they that. We didn't go looking for documents until, like, whenever, a year ago? or No, but I'm asking you for your... I mean, so, so you're, you're content that it's been followed correctly. So your opinion... As a man who, in your own admission, is involved in the building, building trade, you, in your opinion, in terms of one part of the process, I'm sure you will agree with because they followed the process, in your opinion. But in terms of the other part, where the private sector consultant who's in charge of the job destroyed documents before any of us, yourselves included, the Derek themselves, to satisfy themselves that the process is, is correct and above board, none of us can get to see these documents. So no. what's your opinion on that? You think that's acceptable? Uh, no. It doesn't surprise me that the documents were destroyed or sent back to whatever happened to the documents. Destroyed? No, let, let's be clear. These were destroyed. They were not sent uh, back. I, they, we, they, we know that the contractors didn't get them. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Right. The private had, consultants had, acting on behalf of RBL destroyed contracts. Well, put, it, put it another way. Had Graham's 
or allergic to A, B, C, no, no, but, no, but I had Grimes or Patton or H and J Martin or Farrens felt that there was anything untoward with mm. the process, they would have objected to it. And I, that, 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 that's, that's all right. I can add to the process. I can't comment on. Well, the, if I was the maybe one of, of the four contractors, I would have to say, um, given the climate that we're in today, to take on the public sector, mm. to suggest. You know, and, and spending money to take on the public sector, I find it very difficult. Trevor, so, so just to assume that one of those four contractors would have done that if they felt, felt the process was incorrect. So but the other thing we have to remember is are we sure that Patton's, Farns, Graham's and H and J Martin are aware in terms of this process and how, in I'm our sorry. opinion, are we assured that those four contractors are as familiar with how the contract has been adjusted? We'll not use the word right, we'll just say adjusted to get the outcome where the, the, the contractor who won the contract came from fifth place to first? I, I, I would um, s well, sorry, would Phil, just okay. Uh, uh, there's one of those companies which was at one time ranked first yeah, at well. one stage. When they went to the wall, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's but issue. none of them would have complained, Mr. Copeland. I mean, well, I mean that was before the documents yeah, were destroyed, presumably. Met, Mr. Sir, sorry, Sir George may not have been aware either. Well, I mean, yeah. I've been, I mean, you're, I mean, we're all been involved in public sector well. for quite a while. And we've been involved in tenders and contracts, and I have been in. I have seen many contracts coming in where contractors have put in for them or various suppliers. But once they know the outcome that they have failed to be successful, some will ask for the results of that. Some others don't. I don't. So we can only assume. We can only assume. I wonder if I could. I mean, uh, we've been. Got, I mean, from my point of view, there seems to be a way of perhaps bridging. The differences here between us. Uh, That'd be good. Um, on the one hand, you know what I'm hearing, um, a lot of which um, I'm unaware of. I mean, first of all, uh, people are saying there's inadequacies with CPD. I'm not competent to uh, to judge that, but uh, it is certainly not the responsibility of the lyric or ourselves. And I think Mr. Copeland and others accept that. Uh, there seem to have been inadequacies with. There may have been inadequacies with the private sector. Uh, consultant. Uh, certainly the documents disappear and of course uh, I have to accept that uh, once that happens uh, it doesn't look too good, does it? I mean obviously uh, I think a fellow countryman of mine, Conrad Black, uh, got into difficulty in that regard uh, with uh, certain inquiries, uh, Lord Black I should say, in uh, the United States, etc. Uh, you have got difficulties but uh, that is what I think is raised in your minds the impression that perhaps everything wasn't straightforward. And I can see why that happened, what Mr. Cullen's saying, what Mr. Clark's saying, Mr. Copeland's saying. So I see that point of view. Uh, I hope you could see perhaps our point of view, uh, which is uh, from our perspective, and we weren't involved in all of that, of course, that was uh, other activities. Uh, we are three private citizens, volunteers, giving up uh, uh, time, etc. And indeed, in fundraising, once anybody asks you to raise money, you know it's going to cost you because you can't go and ask people for money unless you give yourself. So every time I get asked to raise money, I know I'm going to be a little bit the oh, poorer for it. Uh, and yet, we've been hammered. And I think there's one big point, and I now understand much better as a result of this inquiry how you got to where you are. Because the thing that really leapt out to me, of course, which is a factual error, completely a factual error, is what was said, I think, in the audit report, what, and I accept it. You're only going on what, you don't do the basic investigation, you're relying on the audit office, and I completely accept the need for public sector scrutiny of public sector money. And nobody's denying that this committee doesn't perform a useful function. But well, they Mr. claimed Madolvo's, it was the sorry, same Mr. Madolvo's day, Madolvo's the same he, meeting. Sorry, Mr. Madolvo, Madolvo never said that. Because he I says, never we, said that. He says we piggyback, I think was his words, yeah. on the Stronson. Okay. Front. Well, I was trying piggyback. to bridge the gap, Slag not widen it. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to bridge piggyback the gap, Slag not widen it. Uh, well, well, sorry, I mean, can, we just, can we just tie that one down, Sir George? Okay. So, so, and I take the point you're making, and I think that trying to bridge the gap is useful. But I have to say, the very fact in terms of the language and the continuation of Mr. Madol today, he's still <laughs> sticking by his remarks. And I think he's ill-informed, and I think he's not doing any justice for the lyric. And that's my opinion, and I'm entitled to that one as well. OK. Well, everybody's entitled to their yeah. opinion. But I think if you can understand our position, uh, we certainly didn't get £150,000 for our work. We got no. absolutely nothing. In some cases, we had to give. Uh, and when... Uh, 
and the chair has mentioned it's an impression, I accept that, but you can imagine what happens when people come up to us because you know better than anybody as politicians how the media will treat this. And although you put impression there, et cetera, this quickly gets lost, it quickly becomes a fact. Yeah. Me, Sid, Phil, rigged and manipulated the outcome of this bid. I mean, you say you didn't say that, you're absolutely right. But I think as experienced politicians who have to put up with the media more than probably anybody, you must have realized uh, what would happen once this hit, uh, hit the headlines. And uh, it's a very serious charge. And uh, the one thing I want to repeat again, as far as I know, de DECAL does not accept uh, what uh, was being said. Uh, it says here, if such evidence exists, this would suggest a breach of the public contract regulations. Therefore, if the committee is aware of evidence, we respectfully ask that we be given it, because presumably yeah. they would want to take proceedings. But, well, it's interesting. They have accepted the report, unlike yourselves. They've they, accepted, they, they have accepted the report. Well, so, so I I'm think not that, responsible for decal. No, no, but I mean, once you're quoting him on one hand, let's put in the record that decal have accepted the report and the findings of the report. It's interesting. Okay, I mean, I can't explain yeah. that, but I mean, here's their, here's but can, their can statement. I back, we, I mean, we have I, no quarrel with the recommendation. Yeah, no, no, can no. I go back to Phil, just, just to, for clarity's right. purposes, in terms of four contractors, one contractor did raise concerns, but didn't pursue it legally, and that was Graham's. So, just in case we're missing okay, for anyone, so we have one of the contractors out there who are concerned about that. But Graham's uh, took part, took the opportunity for feedback after the uh, um, tender process uh, and were provided with um, information. Uh, as a consequence of that, they wrote and expressed some concerns and said they would like further time to consider their position. And in order to accommodate that, the Alcatel period was extended by a further week, but nothing further was held, heard from Graham's. Well, I mean, I, I mean, just to keep Phil, I mean, Phil didn't believe anyone had raised concerns. Yeah. They did. But the other point, and I, and I made before I had this piece of information, yeah. that it wouldn't surprise me that they're actually taking on the public sector, that they wouldn't pursue it because it would be a difficult, it's a difficult, uh, it would be a difficult one to break unless you had the finances to do it. And I'm sure they were disappointed knowing they were first in the first round of the tender valuation and moved quick, swift, swiftly down the, the ranking after some of the adjustments have been made. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you, Mr. Clark. I'm, I'm going to let the deputy chairperson in, in here at this point. Um. Chairperson, thanks very much. Uh, first of all, I'm glad to see some uh, variation developing between Sir George and Mr. McDowell. I'm hopeful now that we might very actually easy. get a report out of this, which will be useful for the future. The report was agreed by the department, and I think that's maybe said earlier, but it's useful to see it again. There's something else I must say, Chairperson, and I'll say it with the authority of being the longest serving member of this committee. I've never heard a more disgraceful attack on the audit office in all the years I've been here, and it seems to me that Mr McDowell doesn't seem to realise that the Audit Office is an independent organisation, something which Northern Ireland is extremely proud of and badly needs. It may also surprise them to know that in the past, the Public uh, Accounts Committee has come across contracts that have been seriously flawed, that where there have been cartels, where contracts have been rigged. So for that reason alone, it's entirely appropriate that we scrutinise every report that comes from the Audit Office. Why do we do it, Chairperson? I think we need to remind ourselves. We need to understand what happens, and we expect that at a civilised meeting. At one stage, I thought, Sir George, we were at a hearing of Father Ted earlier on, and you can read Hansard if you wonder what that was about. We need to know what lessons can be learned. We need to know how we can improve the system. I think most importantly, we need to know how we can assure the public that their money, and it's not my money, your money, their money, is value for money. And Chairperson, finally, I think it's important, particularly important, when it comes to the arts, because it's extremely difficult to get public money that others demand for education, for health, 
uh, for a whole range of services. And to get millions of pounds for a theatre during times of austerity, I think, was a fantastic achievement. Uh, that's my opening remarks. I, I'll just get down to just the basics. Uh, and it has been mentioned, I think, by Michael. Any contract where £413 million pounds is removed and then add it back in again surely at least raises questions as to what was going on. Now, you may feel you've already answered that, and I think, George, by you shaking your head, seem almost uh, irritated by the very mention of it. Sir, oh. Sir George. Sir George, what did I call uh, George. <laughs> Look, I recognise these men have got their plaudits for their outstanding work, and to be honest, I think it would be good if you take the criticism occasionally as well, because certainly if I was invited to Buckingham Palace, you know, for the plaudits, I would then be extremely careful about what I say <laughs> afterwards, because it bestows upon you a great responsibility for, for, for that great honour you have been given. And I'm afraid... On this occasion, the lyric, it was for low I, and I'm Yeah, I'm afraid on this occasion you let yourself down, but that's my view. Uh, just for the report, because we will have a report, how do you explain taking almost half a million pound out of a contract, out of, a, of the figures for the, for the highest tender? Take 413,000 out, that makes them almost the lowest tender, and then put it back in at the end again. Sir George, you are loquacious, let's hear it. Well, uh, this is not something I have any expertise in. It's Phil's uh, level of ex area of expertise. Well, uh, sorry, I really meant uh, to answer the question because I heard that broadcast too. You nearly crashed the car. Uh, tell us, how, how do you? I mean, you're, you said here that the process of awarding this contract was beyond criticism because it follows the established practice at the time, and then you went on to well. This year. Well, the process uh, which was carried out was this one. Let's hear how you, you, how can you Have just... you got that? Yes. How can you, you just... Got that? As a committee, you've got that. It, well, read it. Well, it's the... It's the, end, the code of procedure for selective tendering for design and build. But it wasn't followed till the, till the words. So it wasn't, it wasn't followed. followed. Just in the one respect. The contract was destroyed. It wasn't followed. It wasn't followed. Wasn't followed. Wasn't followed. Wasn't followed. In that one respect. So then it wasn't yes, followed. It wasn't followed till the words. We weren't it followed. It wasn't followed. It wasn't followed. We weren't in, in control of what RLB well, were well, doing. Well, you're using that as your defence. So that's you're putting that up as your defence that it was followed. Not as defence, for information for the committee. And we're, we're informing you it wasn't wasn't followed. And that, that's the same document that tells you to return tender documents. Tender that's documents. Right. It's not us. Mm -hmm. well, the professional advisors. Yeah, acting on your but, behalf. But followed. the process of uh, equalising tenders, so that you're comparing, can I interrupt there, can I interrupt there like just a few like minutes, is provided for in that. If you're saying that was followed right through the procedure of the award and the contract, how can you be sure of that whenever the RBL didn't follow the procedure after the contract was awarded? So you can't be safe you can. for sure it was followed word by word. Well, look, I accept if, if the documents were destroyed, that part of this procedure, sorry, this procedure. Uh, yes. So it wasn't was, followed? It wasn't followed. It, yes. So how can you be sure it was followed at the earlier stages of the well, project as well? I review the documentation and review the, all, the, all the backup information. My opinion is that apart from that one bit where the documents were destroyed, Conveniently. the procedure appears to have been followed. Yeah. Can I ask in your few, Mr. Chivers, what, what is your, you said you're involved in building background. Yes. What, what is that, you know, what, what, was it a surveyor or, or architect or what, what background is that? By profession, I'm a civil engineer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. director um, managing director. Of the largest um, company. Largest I'm, company. I'm, I'm managing director of McLaughlin & Harvey. The, the other thing I would like, I would like to add, um, and I'm quoting from the April 2008 health check commissioned, um, was it commissioned by CPD or? By uh, DECAL. Uh, by DECAL. Just a quotation out of this, uh, a conclusion. A preferred bidder has been selected. This is only a month or so after we picked our preferred bidder. Following a robust tendering process that has been overseen by CPD 
EFP acting as COPE for this process. And that, that was, that was a, a detailed health check that was carried out shortly after the tender process. And that health check said that the process was a robust tender Which has process. been proven not to be the case now because CPD weren't at the tender evaluation. It doesn't prove that. Oh, it doesn't prove that. Right? C well, how naive are you that that doesn't prove that? I'm not the, very fact, the very fact, the very fact they weren't there, there no proves there no that it wasn't taken, followed robustly. There's no decisions taken at the meeting. CPD were not represented at one right. meeting, yes. but they were <coughs> they an integral to part the of the review. process and gave evidence to that gateway review. They gave evidence on the basis that they weren't at something. So what 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 weight does that give that that report then? They were interviewed as part of that report. Even they though they weren't at the tender evaluation. CPD were not didn't attend one meeting. One meeting where we stripped the, the tenders from the cheapest being 10.8 million and the dearest being 11.6, and we finished up with 11.6 winning the contract. Mr. Clark, it wasn't done at that meeting. That wasn't. That's done. where. Well, that's where the outcome was. The outcome of that meeting was the same as the result that your board agreed. It wasn't done at that meeting. The outcome of the stripping of the tenders couldn't done be done that because that procedure provides for the equalisation process to take place. Yeah, and also provides for tenders to be sent back, which it didn't do. Just one small point, and I think it comes down to the action of destroying the documentation that could have answered a lot of these questions. Yeah. Who engaged this company, and who was responsible for ensuring and Good dictating question. their Good course question. of actions? Well, who, the Lurk engaged them. Right. Um, there were a group. I actually. Uh, I can't remember who exactly was on that group, but there were a group of three or four, maybe five people who were part of that process. But the, they, um, they, they a, felt were clear from the outset. Sorry? That they would have been made clear by yourselves from the outset at the time of, an, of appointment that their operation in regard to these matters should have been dictated by the NJCC. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And that yes. was drawn to their attention by yourselves, and they didn't. We, 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 we would not have drawn their attention to the fact that you will not destroy ten, tender documents after well, a period it, it, That's time. inculcated in that document, uh, isn't it? It would, have been, it, would, it would have been part of their appointment that they comply with their own professional standards, and the NJCC would have been part of the. Part of that, that. that. I'm quite sure of that. I've so, without wanting to apportion blame, but the, 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 the ultimate responsibility for that would lie with them and with those who engage them, which. Was yourselves but we did not. Case. We did not check every detail of everything that they did. We employed them to carry out a function. They carried out that function uh, in principle, I think, properly. They appear to have destroyed documents. Have destroyed the apart, apart, um, that. Um, and I and I and I do think they have followed. I do think they have followed the procedure. We asked how were they selected. I, th I think I think you asked how how were they selected. It was um, CPD were an integral part of that process, a chap okay. called John Hanvey. It went out to uh, a PQQ and it was a, it was a quality price assessment and they were selected. And I would say they can, I, I, I have no idea what the fees were as part of that process, but they, they, they were one of the few practices in the country Just that had a specialist theatre division and a specialist uh, D division who dealt with theatres and had a real track record of theatres. Prior to the Lyric, really theatre-wise, there, there hadn't been much built that I'm aware of, certainly in Northern Ireland recently, and even in, even in the UK, and any, any theatres that had been built, these guys were part of it. So we relied heavily on them for, for the price and the costing advice. It certainly created Chair a problem, person. didn't they? Surely, Mr Cheevers, if you had even an elementary knowledge of how public contracts are handled, you would know that documents must be kept for seven years. Did you know that? No. Well, what were you doing in charge of a £17 million uh, project when you didn't know the documents are kept for seven years? That's not my view. It's not the chairperson. It's not the audit office. It's government. The, the, one of the uh, weaknesses identified uh, with this particular uh, project, and presumably with others, is that um, that requirement should have been made clear in the offer of grant, and I believe that's one of the recommendations in your report, 
which has been accepted by, by government, that it should be made clear by departments who are sponsoring capital projects. It wasn't in ours, and uh, this code of procedure uh, was included in the um, invitation to tender to the, the five tenders, and uh, that set out the process by which the uh, contract, the tenders, would be assessed. Mr. McDowell, in your own bibliography, you have told us you have had a lifetime in public life with housing executive and others. Are you telling this committee today that you didn't know that documents should be kept for seven years? We are following the process which is led down and approved by CPD. Look, sorry, I, I, I don't want to use the analogy, but the pantomime season is over. You knew documents should be kept for seven I didn't years. Know so. Well, that's astonishing. It's amazing that someone who had their whole life handling public money didn't know that documents have to be kept for seven years. I steer the boat. I don't row it. Sorry? I steer the boat. I don't row it. not very good at it. Well, you're not a very good captain, I can tell you. No. Well, I've delivered this project successfully. Well, I wouldn't say it's successful. Mr. Well, Bell, I mean, mean, you're judging. We followed that procedure. What I'm not going no, follow, to follow it. We followed that procedure. No, you didn't letter. follow it because you, you, we you've now, that procedure you've now discovered. Letter. No, you didn't actually follow it. Yes, letter. we did. Well, it just letter. shows you how poor you are as a leader then because you didn't. You didn't return the tenders. So you didn't follow it to the letter. I didn't return to this. That's left in this document. Well, you have to send you follow it to the letter. Whether you it's follow it to the letter or not. It's the responsibility of the RLB to return the documents. Yeah. People use the word of the contract to us, right? If I'm Mr. Mr. Clark, I, 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 speaking personally, I never even knew that the documents had uh, been destroyed until this uh, all came up, and we're you know several years away from from this point. I know. Uh, Mr. Dallas's point, uh, I know. I certainly hold on to my tax records for seven years. My accountant tells me I have to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done, uh, as you know, because I've appeared before other committees, quite a few public inquiries. It's certainly uh, one doesn't keep all of that for seven years. So I mean, I'm I'm unclear as to what should be kept for seven years and what shouldn't. I am clear, I think, that it would have been uh, good practice if uh, the firm had kept these documents and not destroyed them. And it's obviously led to a huge range of problems for all of us, for yourselves, uh, for Decal, etc. Uh, but uh, uh, the thing that impressed me was at the very end we had the gateway inquiry. And uh, Phil has read from that. The Gateway Inquiry is, as I understand it, not being expert like Phil is and, uh, and Sid on these matters, that it is the gold standard of the health check to make sure that you follow the procedure. And uh, Phil has read out the conclusion, which gave us not just a clean bill of health, but uh, rather, um, you know, a great uh, in terms of that. And that was, I assume, before the documents yeah. were destroyed. I take, I take the point you're making, Sir George, but whenever you give, and as Phil has said, some of those who filtered into that, being CPD, they're hardly going to suggest, in terms of the gateway inquiry, they've done everything right when they know they've done it wrong. And I mean, part of that has been uncovered. They've, they've, they have recognised that again by the acceptance of this report, and they've recognised it when they came to this committee, that they should have a representation to the, to, uh, the, the evaluation meetings of the contracts. Well, that's CPD. So CPD is the same people who fed into your gateway report who you're holding up as an exemplar here today. Well, not just CPD. I no, mean, but they were one of those. They were one of them, sure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, Mr. I'm, going to let, I'm going to bring Mr. Rogers in here. Mr. Thank you, uh, Sir George, for acknowledging uh, that in terms of good practice, you should have held on to those records for seven years. But when the, this, sure that. With the audit office did blow up, this did blow up, how... Have you challenged the, the consultants, this, these London consultants of yours, about the fact that they destroyed the documentation? I, I, uh, I must admit that, uh, although I'm quite active in the arts, uh, my reason for being invited onto the board of the Lyric Theatre was not because of my knowledge of the theatre, it was because of my knowledge of fundraising. And uh, I haven't been on the board uh, since, um, I have to be careful, I think it was 2011. As soon as the project was successfully completed, uh, my job was done. So it's not for me to challenge, but uh, um, again, Phil, I'd have to look to you. But I mean, uh, uh, this is a professional firm, highly rated, etc., etc. It was engaged, and here we are. Uh, six years away from when these decisions were actually taking place. I mean, uh, uh, I haven't been involved with the project. I don't think uh, any of us have. I, I don't think it's our job uh, to do this. I mean, that's why we have CPD. That's why we have uh, professionals uh, doing it. Um, you know, where uh, the lay people 
who are actually saving a good deal from the public purse. And uh, Mr. Dallin, I think uh, you may object to the language that's been used by some of us, but I don't think it's very conducive to calling it a pantomime. Uh, I watched Father Ted, but I didn't get the reference. I thought you could resonate with that word. Sorry? I thought you could resonate with that word. Well, I don't. And I mean, the committee seems to have a very thin skin. Fortunately, I don't. So I don't take any objection to it. But going back, you were talking about shortcomings and so on earlier, and shortcomings of CPD and so on. Do you not believe that was a shortcoming that, that these people haven't been challenged on this? Um, I believe the, our Chief Executive, Kieran McCauley, has gone back to RLB um, and asked, first of all asked them for documents and then asked them to uh, explain why they didn't have the documents. Uh, now, again, uh, I'm not maybe properly prepared for this question, but the uh, answer is we, you have a, a division of the company that in the recession, which 208, 209 started to bite, RLB, after, after the end of our, of our project, the John Burgess chap, who was the expert in theatres, uh, retired. His uh, section, his specialist section of the RLB office closed down. I believe they moved office and anybody who had been working on the project was, was really no longer employed by the firm. So whilst uh, now we, we, we haven't, as, as far as I'm aware, we haven't taken it any further than that. So do you recognise there's a possible shortcoming there? Um, possibly, yes. But it's, uh, it's after the event. Uh, Okay. Um, in terms of what the deputy uh, chairperson talked about, the public person, that's why we're here, because value for money and the public person so on. And it was a point you mentioned earlier in terms of, you know, transparency within these tender procedures and the fact that um, some, of the, some of the companies didn't complain. Is it possible they didn't complain because they didn't actually re recognise? You know, you talked there, for example, about the, 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 the tending process for, for scaffolding, that you could have scaffolding tendered separately, but then you might have some scaffolding tendered separately, some in the contract for windows, some in the contract for bricklaying. You know, is that a, an open and transparent process? I, I think it is. The way, the way it was dealt with by RLB in terms of, you know, assessing the tender I, I, and the way they wrote, they, they wrote each contractor, yes, I, I, I think it was dealt with properly and professionally. Okay, thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Can I just come out and ask yeah. you, Phil, I, I struggle with this, with your background. I mean, that's what's made me struggle with this one. Well, I mean, if you, well, if you wear two hats, which you probably were in this case, because you're wearing a hat in terms of interest in the lyric, and you've got the hat in terms of the expertise you bring from the Mr. building. Clarity, I uh, agreed with the lyric board um, before I joined them, before I got involved in this process, that if they were going to build a theatre in Midlockett and Harvey, would not take part in it. Oh, oh no, no, sorry, I don't mean it. No, no, I'm making no reference process. to that at all. No, the, uh, point, the point I'm trying to draw is but that we're so, so wearing the hat in terms of the lyric and the public purse here, trying to obtain the best value for money. Why? I mean, and it, I mean, it may be in your guide, albeit everything in terms of that guide wasn't followed, but why would you get to a case where you actually go out to a contract and say, we want you to build this, whatever the case may be? Now, that will be up to the, the contractor to know what equipment he requires, what he's going to have to hire in and whatever else he has to do. Yeah. Why then would you get to a case where you would say, well, there's a variation in these prices. Let's look at these prices. Oh, they have allowed 400 for scaffolding. They have allowed 85 for scaffolding. We should ask everybody to take this out. That's the bit I'm struggling with, Phil, and I would like, yeah. from your... So, sorry, I mean, if Phil could answer the question, I'm sure he could do it on the edit with you, you said, because I'm sure he's an awful lot of experience in the building trade. He enjoys my assistance. <laughs> he must be um, a smart man. It's yeah, <laughs> I know. No. We all have burdens to carry. Um, sorry, Phil. The committee's pretty good at handing it out, a little less good at taking yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Like, well, I don't want to go into the detail here, because you're, you're going into the, the detail of tendering and even tender strategy and interpretation of documents. And There's a detail we're interested in. Yeah, well, when, when a... But when you're pricing preliminaries, a contractor can take a view on on site staffing, on site security, on scaffolding, on temporary electrics, uh, and some of those things 
in this form of tender, and that's that's what this form of tender is not unique. It's it's normal, but it's different from just giving somebody a price to do a job. Um, the preliminaries, and, and it could be a misunderstanding, it could be tender strategy to make your price look cheaper, but some price the scaffolding low, some price the scaffolding yeah. high. Yeah. The high price, I would say, was probably the, full, the proper cost. Pricing the, I have seen instances where people would put scaffolding in at nil. Yeah. Now, that's clearly, there's no money allowed for scaffolding. But so can, we, can, we, can we drill on that just... Just so is my own mind. This, this is where I'm struggling most. Yeah. Where we can take 400,000 out, and, and what it looks like to manoeuvre it, put someone in a different position, and then at the end it, put them back in. So, so if we're going out to tender, I mean, the biggest thing I've ever built in my life has been a house. Mm -hmm. But if I went to four builders and said, give me a price for building my house, I assume they'll bring all the equipment and everything they need, and they'll give me a price to build a house. That's correct. And I would say, and I mean, let's round, obviously round, I mean, is it 100,000 or is it 108,000? And I would pick the cheapest, because I assume he's going to, it's turnkey, I want my house, I want to turn the key in the door. Why, in terms of this contract, why are we, I mean, it looks to me that we're actually advantaging people in terms of, and this is a layperson, I'm not the builder, so that's why I'm speaking to you, Phil, because you're, you're the guy coming with the experience here. As a layperson, why would I not look at the 10.8 million as opposed to 11.6? Why would I interest myself in the fact that, well, he's allowed 400,000 for scaffolding, he may have allowed nothing, but that's actually his problem, because how is he going to build this height without, no, no. This height without the scaffolding? That's his problem. What, what the surveyors, what RLB will have assumed that there was a misunderstanding of what they wanted in the scaffolding package, so they've removed it, or set it aside, whatever. But the, when you talk about the turnkey price, yeah. uh, that is the price that Gilbert Ash confirmed on the 22nd of October. Yeah. This, this is a two-stage tender, yeah. and that's the difference. What you're talking about is a single-stage tender. Yeah. And, you know, both private and public use both forms of tender. They're, they're, they're both reg regularly used. But our the turnkey price from Gilbert Ash is the 13.2 million on the 22nd of October, and that would have included everything that they need to build the building, including scaffolding and all the, all the other things I mentioned. Okay. But the stage one tender, that's what we're talking about here, the first stage tender. Yeah, okay. it, it just seems an awful lot of assistance to, to whoever the contractors are. We were surprised, Mr Clark, when uh, Mr Heaney from CPD was asked, was this uh, getting down a situation where comparing like with like normal in the industry? And he said no, because anybody who's working in the industry would know that you have to get a... You have to compare apples with apples. Mm -hmm. You have to compare like with like. So if there's a provision of 400,000 for scaffolding and a provision of 83 for scaffolding from another contractor, the real danger uh, for the public purse is that the, the lower provision will seek to more than recover that money once they're appointed as a parent bidder and during the second stage of the process. So comparing like with like is really important if you're going to get to a sensible comparison which protects the public purse. Well, then, then go back, Phil, to... So the 413,000 has been taken out. So, so for comparison purposes, yeah. Yeah, so I'm getting, I'm getting a wee bit of a grasp of that. Why was the other adjustment of 347,000 there? That's what... I... Can you show me where that is? Because I... Can I pass this to Yeah, you can indeed. Daniel. Sorry, I'll draw that. That's, a, that's an abstract from the actual report. Okay. So on the so of the four hundred thirteen thousand, which is the first adjustment that's been taken out, the next one is non applied, non applied, non applied to the four contractors, and another three hundred and forty seven thousand nine hundred and fifteen thousand pound adjustment to Gilbert Ash. I, I can't answer the detail of that. All I can say is it will have been part of a negotiation discussion with Gilbert Ash. Uh, and you'll appreciate then the difficulty we have again because yeah. all our tenders were destroyed. So Oops, now we're, we're now looking at a case where we're at this stage now with 760,000 has been removed from the original price. And, no, well, and, and I'll accept the explanation you're given today, Phil, in terms of the 413,000 in terms of a two-stage process. 
But because of this two-stage process, we have no explanation of why 347,000 adjustment has been made to move the tender who was sitting in fifth place now to third. I, I would need to come back to the committee on that. Um, I, I cannot answer that Please as we sit here now. Yeah. There's but, no but, there's no but I mean, for the benefit, I mean, Sir George, and I know you're looking because this may be the first time we have seen some of this detail. We have put this detail, and the only thing we can get is the tender documents have been destroyed. So again, this is where we can draw our conclusion. Why? And why can we go from a position where someone can be fifth to first? After at this stage, we've taken out close on eight hundred thousand pounds worth. Yes, sir. Well, I think we're saying, Mr. Clark, that uh, first of all, we don't know why. Neither do we. And you don't know. Neither does the office. And uh, although, to some extent, I think Phil has suggested that uh, the theatre department was. Uh, uh, shut down or whatever uh, after the hard times came. I mean, somebody was very complimentary about raising the money. Uh, it was really the good luck of the Irish, I can tell you, because if we had started a couple of years later, we would not have been successful in raising the money because, of course, as you well know, 2008 was the watershed, which we've all been living in a completely different uh, economic world. But uh, uh, like all of these things, you look back, you're not quite, none of us are really sure why these documents were destroyed. There could be a very sinister motive. Uh, there could be I .e. fraud, uh, there could be incompetence, uh, or there could simply be, uh, as someone who's very interested in history, whenever firms close or sections close, people throw the junk out, uh, i.e. all the old paperwork. So we don't know. Uh, I accept the point that it, it obviously leaves us all with a question. I don't know if Phil could uh, answer that question if he had time to study it. But uh, the puzzle I find, I mean, I wasn't involved in this side of it. I was involved in the money side. Why would we be so anxious that Gilbert Ash should get the contract? Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know one contract from another. I would imagine most of the members of the Lyric Board didn't know one contract from another. There's been no one suggesting that we got paid no, 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 no. <laughs> in order to give it. No, That's I'm not saying you're not suggesting this. No. So I find it puzzling. You know, there may well be incompetence, but I really do not think it was the job of uh, members of the board of the Lyric, uh, whatever time period afterwards, months, years, whatever, mm. to police what a private sector consultant was doing. I mean, I really do not yeah. think that that is a reasonable expectation to expect of uh, three people, or in the case of the whole board, uh, people who are voluntarily giving their time, uh, that after a year or two, we're supposed to be policing what a private sector consultant And I, I accept what you're saying, Sir George, and I think that's a reasonable comment to me. But, but I mean, and I'm not being facetious, but have you read the whole report? No, I haven't. I actually think it would have been good if you'd read the report before we come today. Because why we're here today, I think, is because the comments that Mr. Madol made. Sorry, let me finish. No, my which point. reports are you talking about? Yeah, I'm talking about the audit office report. No, I haven't. Well, I read I, your report. Yeah, I think, I think the report would, if you'd have read the whole report prior to coming, you would have seen that there's nowhere we suggest that anything in particular about the lyric themselves. We were criticising everyone who's been involved in the process, and for that reason we are here. To, we're, we're discussing this today because the bit I'm struggling with when Mr. Madol goes on record. First of all, he's suggesting. I mean, from well, my understanding, from what he's saying is that we're only criticising the lyric. We're criticising the lyric as a project, but it's how we arrived at the spend. We we looked at original business case. And you'll know plenty about business cases, Sir George. How the originals, we, we, we start off the process on whether we're going to get the green light to make a project go or not. DFP have said they had concerns, or was with the reservations, I think it was, in terms of letting the process okay. continue. But we went from 12 million to 17.8. Now, I'm not saying that is the board member's fault. No. I'm talking about the processes, and it's an entirety. That's what the report has said. It has singled no one out. Mr. Madol's comments has singled this committee out as if this was a witch hunt for the lyric, and it clearly wasn't. This is a process about how this government functions, how public money has been spent, and how they have failed. And CPD have clearly failed in their duty in terms of how they got involved in the process and how we have ended up with the lyric costing 17 million as opposed to the 12 odd million that they told us at the start. Okay. Well, Mr. Clark, I, I now have uh, a much better appreciation of how the committee arrived at this decision. 
uh, I would hope that perhaps the committee might have a better appreciation uh, of why we were shaken by it. Uh, even though, as you say, uh, our names personally don't appear here, it's CPD, it's DECAL, and uh, the Arts Council that is getting uh, slapped uh, on the wrist. But if you look at paragraph one of what I submitted, when you read a statement that says, at the same meeting in which the project board approved the fist price contract with the preferred bidder, it was agreed that the preferred bidder would become patrons of the Lyric Theater with a donation of 150000 This effectively means that the Lyric's fundraising team, which of course I was the chairman of, uh, was pursuing patronage from the preferred bidder at the same time contract negotiations were ongoing. Well, I hope you'll accept that it was a factual error. It was not done at the same meeting, and I would hope well, again... Well, it was in, in the minutes, Sir George. It was in the minutes of that meeting that it was. That's, that's well, I think, think we've already... Uh, yeah, well, well, that, you can if, see if where we're coming this, from as well. And if it was a mistake, it was put in the minutes. Certainly it wasn't our mistake. We were reading what we had in front of us, and that was the minutes of that meeting. Well, uh, I'll have to check that. But, I mean, the, the facts of the case are set out here that uh, it was agreed on the 24th of October, the meeting was on the 27th of October. It's simply not right. But I'm asking you to accept why we might get a little startled, at least let's just say myself and others, when I see it was the fundraising team, me, and in effect, uh, the impression is that the process was agree was rigged and manipulated. I don't think, Perception given your, think your sensitivity to some of the things we've said, it was perhaps all that surprising, even though I have got a thick skin, you can't raise money if you haven't got a thick skin because yeah. three out of five people tell you no, yeah. uh, that we perhaps reacted a bit and thought, goodness, somebody's suggesting that uh, in raising the 150,000 pounds from Gilbert Ash, we were participating in a rigged and manipul manipulated process. Now, uh, you know, I agree that it, you can interpret that in various ways, but certainly it was the way the media interpreted it. I think uh, probably more than anybody, uh, politicians would be aware of what the media were likely to do with a statement like that. Can I e equally as much as they did with Mr. Madol's statement suggesting politicians would know more about rigging than the lyric would. Sound bites are great things, aren't they? Uh, can I just come in there, uh, Sir George? Um, you spoke earlier about us being experienced politicians. Do you believe we're political delinquents? Uh, I think that uh, you were not acting in the most responsible way in making that statement, knowing how it might be interpreted. I also think it would have been very useful, given the nature of this debate, if uh, we had had a chance in due process to be called uh, before... Uh, Did have that opportunity? I mean... I personally have never had that opportunity. The opportunity was there, the process, if the process was followed correctly, you would have been in, able to comment on our report or otherwise. I mean, I didn't even know that the uh, that it, the uh, that your committee was looking at. And, this. and it's my understanding. I've been away for well. It's my understanding that our recommendations in our report has been accepted. I'm correct. That's entirely reasonable. Your, yeah. We seem to be sensible and prudent recommendations. Yeah. Okay. The problem for us point. was the fact that on the day of the publication of the report and the Associated Press release, the only organisation that faced uh, a, a torrent of media inquiries was the Lyric Theatre. It's only one that had an adjustment of 800,000. Yeah. But there's, there's, there's no, not a shred of evidence to suggest that the Lyric itself in any way was involved in any shady dealing that produced mm. that no. situation. No, the report actually never say that. It was the project of the Lyric and it's the adjustments in the contract that makes us draw the conclusion that we've come to. But Mr Clark, the reality on the day was that we were faced with this torrent of media inquiries. The whole attention focused and you fed on, it. on the Lyric Theatre project. And you fed it. Huh? And you fed but, it. Well, I had to respond to it because... No, no, you fed it. There's a difference between responding and feeding something. You fed well, that torrent. Well, That's what you've done. Did. You yeah, fed it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a fair bit of passion because I've been... Along with my colleagues here, I've spent thousands of hours mm. and much money of my own mm. in trying to deliver this project successfully, which we did. And that, that wasn't disputed in our report either? No. 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 Um, Mr McQuillan and then Mr Easton. Yes, can I just go back to the, the 348,000 there we talked about, stripped out of the project, which 
Bill, you said you didn't know, you couldn't be able to answer that now at this moment in time. Don't know the details. Will, will you have a wee look into that there and well, come back to us in due course? All I can say is, I'm just reading here, analysis of the return tenders was carried out, which demonstrated a number of inconsistencies within the tender returns. These included, amongst other things, using the wrong base figure for the cost plan, inclusion of an accurate number of weeks for basic preliminaries on, inclusion on of pre-construction fee, and the bond at the wrong level. So th there's obviously, to me, there's been a lot going on. Mm. Now, yeah, that's, that's just one sentence. But yeah. that sentence captures, I think, probably quite a lot of things that were going on that RLB will have dealt with during that tender assessment process. And I think uh, we, we will dig deeper in to find out what... Well, what, 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 what we can answer, can we? Yeah, well, I, I, yeah. we'll track it. We'll try to. Yeah, well, what, what alarms me about that, this whole process around this 348, that Gilbert Ash was the only tender that was stripped. None of the other tenders was touched, so you're telling me there, you know, what, what that sentence is saying, that all the other four or five uh, contractors had got it right first time on Gilbert Ash. No, nice. uh, no, 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 that's... Uh, no, uh, that 348,000, Gilbert Ash was the only tender. None of the other tenders were adjusted at that time. Some were adjusted upwards. So no, none were adjusted at that time. None, no, none, none were adjusted at that time. Yes. Gilbert Ice might have been in an earlier stage, might have adjusted upwards. But not at that stage ever, that 348 can either. That uh, was not adjusted yeah, there was, at that time. Because there was an adjustment, I think, to Graham's at an earlier stage. Yes, maybe at an earlier stage. I'm not saying yeah. it wasn't, but I'm saying at that point in time there, Gilbert Ice was the only the uh, the tender that was adjusted. And that was £348,000 stripped out of it. So I'd like to really know the answer. Get my head around that and why that happened and, and all the rest. And I'd appreciate it if you well, could we will, write to the committee. We'll attempt. I can't guarantee anything, but we'll attempt. Well, that, that's fair enough. That's, that's, that's the best you can do. Uh, I mean, there were difficulties around the fact that, uh, apart from the significant differences in provision for scaffolding, that was earlier. I'm saying, in addition to that, yeah. there were uh, problems in relation to what particular contractors might have provided for attendant labour with one providing for one person to carry out the, the uh, function of attendant labour, with another contractor providing for six staff. Six staff is the more reasonable. And there's a question then of adjusting, taking that out or adjusting upwards, as the case may be, in order to establish the yeah. life-for-life -like component. But what I'm saying was that four, four out of the five contracts prices got it right, and one didn't. And that's, I want to know the reason why they didn't. No. I think Phil has said he will do his best. Yes, that's I'm, I'm, I'm happy to leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. And again, I mean, on the point, um, the chair has made the point that at one point I'm uh, quoting decal, at another point uh, I'm not. Uh, the fact that uh, decal has accepted the report, fine, that's their business. Uh, but I do find it strange that you accept it and then say, uh, we make it clear that uh, they're, they're not aware of any evidence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I've quoted it so many times I won't. Uh, but uh, if Decal wants to accept the report, uh, that's up to them. But uh, the fact that I think we want to make clear is that there is certainly no evidence of wrongdoing. And if there were, then those who were doing the wrong should be prosecuted. Okay, um, nor, nor does the report actually say there was. It gives you the, the, the impression, I think, was the words was used. Well, I wouldn't want to be in a court of law charged with murder and be judged on an impression. Well, the fact is, you have judged yourselves. We haven't judged you. We've said there's an impression. You, you are drawing the conclusion that, that actually means you're guilty. So well, I, I'm, I'm I not think a lot of other people... Sir, I'm not saying, Sir George, I wouldn't let you represent me that day either. A lot of other people have drawn that conclusion. Yeah. You know. But then that's how the media spends things as well, of course. I mean, some of your members were objecting to the phrase political delinquents because that presumably people are drawing conclusions from it or whatever. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I just couldn't care less hmm? what you call me. Pardon well, me? I couldn't care less what you call me. As long oh, as we that's get my position. this report, call me really. Well, obviously, some people did care because well, Sid got certainly... Uh, well, I, I, I'm on the speaking end. for myself, sir. I'm going to let Mr Easton come in and then we're going to wind on proceedings. <laughs> Mr Easton, you've been waiting. Um. Yeah, it's, it's just can I go quickly back to a point, um, Sir George? I wasn't part of this report, so I, I'm learning <laughs> as I'm going along. So, so you're not a delinquent then? <laughs> so I, hopefully I'm not a delinquent now. Um, it's just about the 150,000 do donation towards the, the, the project. Um, could you tell me... How long was the period of time from contract being given to 
to the, the, the winners and then that time before due to so that, that, that money donation coming in from, from the, the winners of the contract? Well, I, I, again, I, um, so if you got the um, the well, paper in front of you... I wasn't able to say that because I was laid down, so I apologise. Oh, OK, fine. Uh, the... Um, Wait a minute here. Yeah, Wednesday the 28th, sorry, the 22nd, uh, Gilbert Ash set the price at 13.2 million, rounding it off, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They were the only contractor in the frame and had been the only contractor in the frame for roughly uh, six months. Uh, and it was two days after that that, in effect, the price was agreed irrevocably. They could not change it. Uh, the stage two was over. I approach Gilbert Ash. The day that it was all agreed? No, not the, the day it was day, all agreed. Two day. days later. Two days. Two days later. Okay. So and that's my basic at, point. Yeah, so at no stage was there any contact between yourself or anybody for a donation between that date and back? No. Um, I mean, to help you, I think the two key dates are they emerged uh, as the preferred bidder on the uh, 6th uh, of March, uh, 2008. And through that period, they then had to begin, as Phil was saying, uh, work out what the price should be. And uh, that occurred uh, on, well, roughly six months later, on the 22nd of October, 2008. And the price that was agreed was 13.2, which, as I understand the building trade, and I'm not an expert like Phil, uh, it's an irrevocable price. Once they s say that, they are committed to it. They can change it unilaterally. Obviously, if you change the plans and whatnot, uh, it would change. But for that specification, and then once I had the green light that that was all settled, the stage two was over, I made my approach. Right. And uh, I think anybody who is experienced in fundraising in uh, you know, you would do that uh, as quickly as possible. I think if a football manager wins the season, he probably uh, acts very quickly after that to suggest that maybe his pay should increase. He doesn't wait, uh, you know, a year. Anyways, we're talking here about corruption. It doesn't matter if it's two days, tw uh, two months, uh, 12 months. I mean, the simple point is, uh, as I said, if I was really trying to, uh, to hide it, uh, I would declare it as an anonymous donation. People very often want an anonymity, not because they're hiding anything, uh, they know that, first of all, there's a security question. If you give a lot of money, your kids might be at risk. Secondly, they know there's people like George Bain around who think, ah, and you make a note of that name, and then I hit him. Uh, and they wish to remain anonymous for that reason. But I mean, it would have been so easy if we really were up to foul play. Uh, for a start, I would not have announced in front of DECAL, uh, ACNI, and CPD that I just got that gift. You know, I simply wouldn't have done it. Why, why would I? I mean, it would have been stupidity. Uh, right. Uh, well, I have to take your, your word. But, you know, I'm, I'm not a fundraiser, so <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know that's normal practice. Don't become one. Should be. And, and I'm not going to. <laughs> but can you see that there could be a perception out there that you're getting a donation from the person who's won the contract in such a short period of time? Like, Suspicious. I don't think so. What I, I mean, I take Mr. Clark's point, actually, that uh, which I understand a good deal better now at the end of uh, this uh, than I did at the beginning. Uh, I don't think there is uh, grounds for a perception on that in the sense that uh, there was two reasons. One is, as I say, this is an opportune moment. Whoever had won the contract, I would have been on their doorstep. Okay. Uh, no is that, question is that, that. why you said... But the second thing is uh, we were really pressed for time etc., etc. I think what has given rise to the impression, and I did not realize this before coming here today, which seems to have been so central to everything, and which I was largely unaware of, is the destruction of these documents. That seems to have been where the impression. And so Mr. Clark, Mr. McQuitty, etc., and other members of the committee are saying, why was this money stripped out, etc., etc.? Why did this happen? And then, of course, at the end of the process, after the end of the process, there was a gift given. A, a, a gift given. Uh, and I can see from that, perhaps, that there might be an impression. But uh, the destruction of the documents is not, I would argue, our responsibility. Uh, it is other people's responsibility. Can, can I just add, Ms. Reeson, that um, the question of managing 
conflicts of interest was fundamentally important. Mm -hmm. And therefore, whilst uh, Sir George and his team would have been uh, engaged in fundraising activities and were champing at the bit, it was made absolutely clear by myself as the SRO and Mr Cheevers that no approach should be made to Gilbert Ash. But once the final contract price came in in writing and could not be changed unilaterally by the contractor, I then had to respond to the pressure and say to Sir George, uh, after consulting with, with Phil, the way is now clear for you to make an approach to Gilbert Ash, uh, which you did with alacrity and produced a, a, a substantial result, a result which was consistent with uh, Gilbert Ash and other contractors in terms of making donations to projects that they had successfully obtained, but no approach made before that final contract price was in place. So, so, George, that sort of is in line in your, your, your wording earlier that this is normal in the, in the industry? So Very much so. So you know of other cases where people have... Yes, I mean, well, actually, this is oh, the first... Go. Well, no, it isn't, perhaps. But certainly uh, at... Well, uh, two other big ones that I've worked with. One was in London, uh, at the London Business School, and the second, let's keep to Northern Ireland, was the uh, Maclay Library uh, at Queen's. Uh, and uh, again, you know, before I retired from Queen's um, in 2004, uh, £40 million pounds was raised uh, for the, the library. Quite frankly, I can't remember even who uh, the contractor was on that because... But they, they give money after the... I don't know. Because actually, the, uh, I had retired by that time. Oh. But uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, I do you have to get on to my main question? If that's okay, yeah. Yeah, going ahead, yeah. Mr. Mado, <laughs> in your letter of the 27th of February to the committee, you referred to protocols and accuracies relating to the process of developing decisions reached in the report. You also said publicly that the NIAO report was an inadequate but incomplete exercise. Perhaps you are aware of the process which I am happy to explain to you. In this case, NIAO agreed the factual accuracies of its report with DECAL and DFP. The NIAO also provided third parties, including the Lyric Theatre, with an opportunity to comment on the report. The NIAO wrote to the Chief Executive, Kieran McCauley, of the Lyric Theatre on the 13th of January and provided substantial extracts of the report for him for comment. This included all of Part 4 of the report, the section for the Lyric Theatre, Kieran McCauley explained uh, that uh, emailed the NIO to ask if he could share the report with members of the Lyric Theatre Capital Working Group, and the NIO agreed to this. Kieran McCauley provided a formal written response on the 31st of January 2013. His letter did not highlight any concerns about the factual inaccuracies and did not propose any amendments to the report. Were you aware that the Audit Office undertook such an extensive clearance process? Yes. Okay. Why did the Lyric Theatre not take the, the opportunity to raise any comments they might have had about the report at that time? A missed opportunity. Did, can I just come in there? Did Mr Macaulay call together the, the, the working group at that point in time? Because he did say that he would do that. He, he said that he would call together the capital working group and agree to the report. Did that happen? Yes, I mean, it did. And 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 who who were the capital working group wouldn't of course been involved with the fundraising activity, which was separate and distinct. Okay, sorry, go ahead, Mr. So, said so you would accept that that was a missed opportunity. So that was a foo on 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 at that time to bring forward your argument. Absolutely, you would accept that. Absolutely. Okay. I would do it differently okay. today. You would. You'd by that stage, that. by that stage, I was becoming. I suppose, in a sense, as a volunteer with many other interests, almost brain dead with my preoccupation with the project. Okay. Uh, there had been a substantial um, distraction in terms of pursuing the project, and uh, it's probably no surprise, therefore, that in trying to resolve that distraction, I was somewhat tired of the process. Okay. But I, I, if I were doing it again, Mr Easton, I would certainly see that uh, a more robust response was made. 
Okay. And just the last question. Given that the Lyric Theatre had an opportunity to engage formally with the Audit Office and had sight of the relevant extracts of the draft report, would it not have been more accurate to say that your response was inadequate and incomplete? Well, um, okay. um, One of my hearing aids is broken. It, it, it would have been better, as I say, to have gone back uh, on that. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of the lead up to the Audit Office report, uh, we did meet with uh, officials from the Audit Office who were engaged in presumably some field work. Um, and the reference to incomplete was to the fact that there were probably surprising omissions from the Audit Office report, uh, both in terms of um, the uh, reference to donations, uh, no reference to the uh, final contract offer from Gilbert Ash on the 22nd. Instead, there was a reference to a final contract price a month before, which is largely irrelevant, um, other than the reports of progress towards the contractor making a final contract price. And equally, in the, in the field uh, gathering work taking place by officials from the Audit Office, I did ask them whether they were aware of um, concern amongst uh, ourselves as clients and other clients of capital projects of uh, an unsatisfactory relationship between clients and uh, CPD. And uh, in due course, I was very surprised that that didn't uh, materialise in the Audit Office report, although I know that your committee uh, subjected, to, subjected CPD to criticism along with others later in the, in the process. Equally, I had asked the um, officials from the Audit Office whether they were aware of the uh, serious difficulties which had been encountered uh, by the uh, SRO and the Larry Project over the vexed question of contamination. That didn't feature in the uh, Audit Office report either. So there was a concern that it was being available for the PAC to examine in its totality was completely absent. Could I just ask you, in light of some of your more critical comments, and now that you know where we're coming from and we know a bit more where you're coming from, do you feel that maybe some of your comments were a bit hard? No, I think we are here. I just, this reason I've spent thousands of hours on this and thousands of pounds on delivering this, as well as that serious distraction over the contamination issue. And therefore, I, I was enormously proud of what we had done and delivered. And therefore, I felt very strongly about the uh, reference to um, uh, the strong impression of being rigged and manipulated. But you can see where we're coming from more now. I think talking is always very informative and useful, generally informative and useful. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I think. I, well, do you want one last? Yes, as yeah. to follow on from, from Trevor's point, or talking to Mr. Bain or Sir George Bain. Um, <laughs> you, you told me earlier on the answer that, that patents had donated as well. I think they have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd uh, be interested to know when they made their donation. I just want to know that from my own head, and for nothing else, just to clear okay. my own mind. We'll have to um, check that. Well, once, once you check that, if you, maybe you come back and tell us how much they donated and when it was donated as well. I think that donation was probably received in towards the end of 2007. Um, and what had been happening before you became involved in the process of seeking uh, tenders, uh, the fundraisers have been engaged in making approaches to a whole range of business organisations, and in that sense, no one was excluded. Mm -hmm. um, it was for the fundraising committee to decide who it is they wanted to approach. I mean, patents, mm -hmm. DA patent, God help them in the current difficulties, both in terms of business and his health, uh, is a well-known philanthropist. So, in that sense, if you approach David, there's a fair chance you'll get some response back from him. Yeah. Uh, just we'll, we'll get to the chapter. It's around right that time scale, but that's, that's why that came in around that time scale. I mean, there were other contractors as well. I mean, uh, perhaps just to uh, reflect credit, uh, uh, Phil's company uh, put itself aside from involving itself. Mm -hmm. It didn't put itself aside from supporting the lyric to the tune of £100,000. Well, I'm interested in that. One of the preferred bidders, and that's the reason I'm I understand. Yeah. I understand. Mm -hmm.
Okay, okay. Thank you, members. Um, I just want to make a, a few small points, and then I'm, I'm going to let the deputy chair conclude. Um, I think, uh, Mr. Chevers, you, you you did make a point earlier in terms of public records, and you, you, you did allude to the fact that it was a small point. But I just want to put on record for this meeting and for the public that are that are listening in, the, the keeping of public records is, is of high importance. Um, so that it instills public confidence and shows transparency in spending public money, and I think that that has to what, what that is one of the um, points that has to be taken out of this meeting here today. Um, how important it is to keep um, public he records. Remember that because he's still building. Neither George or I are likely to be involved in any more capital projects. <laughs> We've no disagreement with uh, with the comment. No. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, I, I also want to say that th this discussion here today has, has, as chair of this committee, has validated my confidence that the committee's procedures, uh, following and conducting this inquiry, were robust, and that conclusions reached by this committee, um, within this inquiry, were neither unjustified nor unfounded. And I believe, and this committee believes, that this confidence can be extended to all of our reports, uh, given that the same general procedures are used for all of our inquiries. And I think um, members of the committee would, would agree, agree with me on that. This was not a criticism of the Lyric um, uh, Board, but at the processes of CPD and how they, they, they followed that process. Um, obviously, best government practice in that. I want to thank you for your time for coming here today to raise uh, your concerns, um, albeit these concerns were raised in an indirect way uh, through the media uh, at that point. However, I think this session has shown that uh, concerns you raised uh, in, in this committee's um, point would be, and uh, some of them would be invalid. At, at very least, the integrity of this committee today has been reaffirmed. Uh, to anyone who might have formed any doubts following the comments that, that has been made in the press launch after the decal report. So um, I want to thank you for, for coming here today and um, I'll have the Deputy Chairperson conclude. Thanks, thank Chairperson. I, I think today's uh, hearing uh, was, was useful. I'm sorry it took so much legal correspondence <coughs> to actually make it happen, but at least it has happened. I think any independent outside observer would agree that there were significant departures from good practice. I think also with the benefit of hindsight, things would be done differently in future. I think there is a clear message that no matter how admirable volunteering and fundraising is, it in no way separates the responsibility for justifying uh, the spending of public money in contracts or indeed uh, any other way and there is no difference in how we seek to justify how every single pound of public money uh, is spent. Uh, one certainly negative side, um, I, I said it earlier and I repeat it, there are over 100 <coughs> staff employed in the audit office. And I say with some authority, having served for 14 years and worked with them, they are the most admirable people that you could ever meet. They are incredibly good people who steered this assembly through many difficult years, often when it was suspended. And I want to place on record my absolute confidence in the controller and auditor general. Yeah. His predecessor, who was an absolute saint, uh, John, <laughs> and uh, that needs to be on record. And it doesn't mean that we don't ever question uh, the work of the audit office. Of course we do, but certainly not in the manner that I heard it here today. Uh, in terms of the witnesses, I, I do have to say that the evidence given by Phil Cheevers was admirable. It was constructive, it was helpful, it was exactly what we wanted. I think the evidence we got from uh, Sir George uh, was uh, constructive and he did accept that there were weaknesses. 
And I'm sorry he took exception to the word pantomime, but I thought theatres have pantomimes, and I'm sure he'll accept it. I didn't say it was a fecking pantomime, and we'll leave it at that. I won't object. Uh, I'm sorry he really uh, said that uh, we didn't just quite pick the same thing up from, from yourself. But I do hope you will give us credit for the fact and you have a long life, public, public life, that this, par this, this committee is above party politics. I don't know how that happened, I apologise. You may turn it off. <laughs> uh, remarkably, in a very difficult political arena... Just stand on it. Stand on it, sweet. <laughs> Sorry about that, Chairperson. You're OK. Uh, we have managed to steer above party politics. We've come through very difficult reports, uh, some of them recently, and we have agreed on it. So really, when uh, you're uh, broadcast uh, to the nation, uh, you know, you were hurting all of us, and I think wrongly. Individually, I think everybody here uh, supports the arts. And personally, I love the Ulster Orchestra. I think they're absolutely brilliant. And they are fine ambassadors for Northern Ireland, so we're not uh, anti, anti the arts. I last saw them in a tribute to Seamus Heaney in the Waterfront Hall, and I'm sure Seamus would have been extremely happy with their performance. Uh, so chairperson. I think that's said whistle on it, yeah. <laughs> chairperson, I think there's a better understanding now of what happened. I think lessons can be learned from it, and I don't think uh, even Sid is going to walk away from here with the same level of arrogance that he had on that radio programme and say everything was perfect, nothing was wrong. And I think perhaps in their future contact there will be a more mature understanding of the work of the Public Accounts Committee and indeed of the Audit Office. And I think uh, the arts will benefit from that because the public do need to be reassured that public money and indeed those who contribute or donate privately need to know that everything is done, particularly in those days of austerity where contracts are extremely hard to win and where uh, jobs are <coughs> dependent and where there is no flexibility, really, for uh, uh, wandering outside the per permitted parameters and the guidelines which were clearly set down by the Public Procurement Director and, indeed, by every arm of government, and they were not adhered to. But, Chairperson, I leave it at that. Thank you, Deputy Chairperson. Thank you, Members, and thank you, Sir George, uh, Mr McDowell and Mr Cheevers. Thank you. Thank and you. Thanks to the Audit Office uh, staff as well. Thank you, Mr Donovan. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Members, um, we have a few pieces of business that we have to I, 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 I to go to at five. So there's, there's just a couple of bits of information under matters arising. Can we just... Yeah, I'm not going to do matters arising and public and then we'll just agree to defer and then we'll go into closed session. Right. Okay. OK, members, um, there's two pieces of correspondence under matters arising. Um, we're going to do this in open session and then we're going to close session. Is that OK? Um, members, at page 12 of your packs is a response from the Audit Office in relation to the correspondence from Mr McCloy, uh, Mr Hugh McCloy of Save the Mid. Uh, you will recall that Mr McCloy uh, wrote to us raising concerns around waiting times in hospital A&E departments. And you'll see from um, Mr Donnelly's response that he will be conducting a study aimed at examining emergency hospital admissions. Uh, the CNAG also references an ongoing review by RQIA uh, following a major incident at the Royal Victoria Hospital. 
Are members content to yeah. note the correspondence? Agreed. Yes, okay, agreed. Um, members, we have a piece of correspondence from the Committee of Employment and Learning. It's a, it's a page 14 and 15 of your packs, and it's correspondence from the Committee for Employment and Learning in relation to a complaint by a staff member or by staff at the South West Regional College. Are we content to note the correspondence yeah. and mm -hmm. forward to CNAG for mm -hmm. further investigation? Okay, members, agreed. Um, thank you for, for that. We'll now move into the closed session of this meeting. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29.